yes it was a crazy sort of um time, like a, a thing for me because i like i thought like the majority of people well i'm stronger i'm fitter he's not a black belt he can't be that good let's let's just roll and um we had like a squash court in most camps and they've, they've got mats in there now which is awesome um and we just rolled for the hour and he literally just filled me in for the whole hour. What he people went. don't realise is, yeah, it has effect on that individual, but that individual's got children, that individual's got a wife and it just has a ripple effect across that whole sort of system because even his kids now have got a different sort of father and they'll be different kids because of that. Yes. So you'll need a, a further, like a further away guard, should we call it. Um, and then as they get closer, you'll need something that's a bit closer. And then they get closer again, you'll need another closer guard. For an example would be X guards. Uh, let's just go with the gi. So we do spider guard. They get closer, I can go to my half guard. They get closer again and get to my deep half. But from each one of them, I should have a... I should have a, a sweep or whatever. Okay, I'm in bottom side. I'm not really tied to the outcome. When this guy moves, I'm going to try and move and get back to a guard or whatever. You feel a bit more confident in that position instead of feeling that like, dread and panic, which everyone feels at the start. Um, it's trying to keep that at bay. Welcome to the Everyday Perspective podcast. Today, we're talking Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu competing and managing injuries with Ricky Bellingham. Uh, Ricky is a Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu brown belt, currently serving in the British Army with uh, the rank of Lance Corporal and is currently a sponsored athlete and has been training and competing full-time for five years. Um, in that time, he's competed uh, nationally, internationally, and has podiumed in the Europeans and Worlds. Welcome, mate. Thank you, buddy. It's about seven years I've been training. Is it seven? Yeah, around about that. Okay. If it's official, like my first first couple of um, training events, but there's a big gap in between it. And then I've been competing for about five years. Yeah, so. okay. Big gap. I know all about those, huh? <laughs> Gaps in training. Love it. Um, mate, thanks for coming on. Um, we want to talk to you, obviously, because you train full time, um, which is really interesting. So it'd be good to get an idea of what your training splits look like. Yeah. Also, you've obviously done very well in competition over the mm -hmm. years. Um, so it'd be interesting to get an understanding of how you prep for competitions um, and also things like your training split, yeah. tactics and, mm -hmm. and psychology and everything else. Um, but before we get into that, I wanted to talk to you a little bit, I guess, about your military career, mm -hmm. obviously still in the British Army. Yeah. Um, be good to understand kind of how you, well, why you joined the military, your time, kind of time there any injuries or, or anything that you've you've had and then yeah. obviously how you found jiu-jitsu as a result of that cool um so i've been in the military now for 14 years um i originally joined when i was 16 um i only lasted six months though when i was 16 i did um phase one they called it then like junior training when you do junior training um you're not let off camp really so in that time period you get put on a train in, in plymouth train station you get sent off on the train get picked up the other end and then you're in training um, for sort of six months. You come home, I think, three times in that period. Mm. But that was like all, when all my friends left school, they were all like out drinking and partying and I was just doing the training. Um, really enjoyed that time, but I just didn't last. I, you know, I was phoning home and, and they were all out and stuff. So I decided to sort of leave, um, rejoined again when I was 22. I think when I, um, in between that period, I was doing various jobs. And I, I did miss the the discipline side of um, of the army. Strangely enough, uh, it's something I'd never had as a, as a child. And also, especially in my job, the infantry, it's not a job where you're sort of um, judged on your um, on your you know your background, on your, what you have in the bank, money wise, or your education. Even you're more judged on how hard you're willing to work. Um, and that sort of that really appealed to me, and something that actually I was quite good at. Um, as you can imagine, when you go into army training, you're putting a, uh, you know, a, a company of men or women, of, say a hundred. You don't know anyone from all, the, all up and down the country, all across the world, and um, you see people that are uh, sort of fitter than you, stronger than you, more educated, better backgrounds, and you think, oh, I'm a bit lost in this situation. But what you tend, what you tend to see, and we'll probably come on to this a bit later on with the jiu-jitsu side of things, is the tough situations, they sort of like show your real character. Um, and I did really well in, in training. So I came top three when I was first in, and then I did various courses where like 125 people did it and I came top of those courses. Um, and you know, I'm not I'm not the fittest or the you know, or cleverest. I just thought I've got a bit more grit than sort of mm. 
the average, if I could look at it like that. I didn't know at the time that it, that it was grit or what it was, so it took me a while to understand that. And um, during my role in the army, I've been all across the world, been to New York, Kenya, Afghanistan, um, done various different jobs such as PTI, which is physical training instructor, which you lads know about. Um, and now I'm lucky enough to be on a sports role. Yeah, which is awesome. Yeah, amazing. So what inspired you to join the army at 16? Because that seems so young, especially as you say all your mates were out on the piss still. Yeah, so at my, my childhood, just to give you a little bit of a backstory, I, I've moved like sort of 10 houses from the from the age of sort of 10, um, all up and down the country. Unfortunately, my parents, um, especially my father, suffered with some kind of, well, it was substance abuse, alcohol. And my mum, she's had her issues in her time. Um, my mum, you know, loved her to bits, but she... She, she she did the best that she could. Um, but I, I never had that discipline or sort of, um, I never had that that at all or, or, or any sort of clear pathway out. Whereas as the armed forces, you can sort of join up, as I said before, they, they, they don't care who you are or they just want to know, can can you work hard? And and as I said, those sort of, those situations in, the, in your past where I didn't realise they ha actually helped me in in training, so I think that's what um, that's what made me sort of seek that sort of discipline side of life. I knew I always wanted more, in a sense, than 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 what was presented at a young age. So, uh, and I was lost within education. The education system was just I was dyslexic, uh, couldn't read, spell, or things like that. And and I think back when I was young. If for me, it was, and because I moved around quite a lot, teachers didn't really, um, I'm not saying they didn't give me the time, but I don't think they they, they knew about dys dyslexia as much. Mm. Or, I mean, now I know how to learn. You know, I, I know that I can listen to audio books if, if I want to read books. I can watch YouTube videos if I want to learn stuff. And I think that's come from the mats as well, learning that and learning how to learn, strangely enough, has helped me along. But I think I was searching for, some, for something else. That's what made me join the military. Danny and I both grew up in council estates as well. Yeah. <laughs> we never joined the military, but it was certainly a consideration at one yeah. point. But loads of my mates did. Mm -hmm. And it was for similar reasons where there wasn't a lot of opportunity. Yeah. And, you know, throughout school, we didn't leave with good grades and stuff. So, yeah, yeah completely get that. And with some of your travels, so I've been to some places, obviously, been on tour too. Have you been to Afghanistan? Yes, say? Yeah, in Kenya. Been Kenya, yeah, so places what, like that. What did you see in those sort of places? And did that change your perspective on where you'd come from at all? Yeah, definitely. Um, I, I think I, I found it easier than most, actually, um, army lifestyle because of what my upbringing, as I said before. But, you know, e even from our perspective now, you know, council lads, we think we're poor, we, you know, and that's what I thought and I believed. But then you go to somewhere like Kenya or Afghanistan and you see these families out there that are like they haven't got no electricity no running water no hot baths no but they're like they're happy their kids are happy they're playing around so I think that had a massive sort of impact in my life and I think every time I've I've traveled and experienced these these things has sort of widened my experience and thought do you know what my upbringing okay it, it wasn't the, the best but it wasn't the worst either and I think you know there's stuff to be sort of taken away from that as a bonus um afghanistan for, for, for a lot of people it's uh it you know it's a, a could be a negative experience but for me it was positive it sort of i was injured over there for one um and you know you get to see some guys that don't come home um and then when i came home i was just so happy to be home so grateful that i'm actually you know home i'm alive i can do sports and, and that sort of shaped my life, I think. From that experience was probably the biggest one. Um, so when you say you're injured, yeah, like what does that mean then? So do you, do you instantly come home from like wherever you are? Yeah, yeah. So I was involved in, a, in an IED blast. It depends how, how bad the injury is, but um, th they had to sort of extract me off the ground and take me back to Bastia and I had an operation there. And then I went over to flew me. I was home in two days. So I was literally out on the ground right at the front and then I was home in two days which is like such a surreal Once something, something like that happens mm -hmm. is that kind of the end of your term like obviously you're okay yeah. now mm -hmm. I don't know obviously what happened and how bad it was yeah. but does that then 
the effect of that then does that kind of release you from military duty for x amount of time yeah or is yes. it like because uh, coming from i don't got a clue you know? mm. it's a bit like um you've got to pass certain tests to like be back on f official duty okay. run this fast you know do these tests and then you get to come back in so anytime you get injured because it happens quite a lot you you just go and they call it into sort of like a, a rehab uh, platoon or whatever and then you get you get fixed and then you come back into normal soldiering after that what was the extent of your injuries, mate, if you don't want us asking? Um, so it was a it was an IED, which is an improvised improvised explosive device. Um I had I had shrapnel through the ankle, piece went right through, um, bottom of my glute, into my elbow, into my shoulder. Um superficial wounds required a few operations. Um, you know, compared to some people, absolutely nothing. Um so yeah, not not too bad. Yeah, and what age were you when that happened? Um, I was. What age would I have been? I would have been just coming into my thirties. It was just before. I've been very lucky with the circumstances in my life. Just before I found BJJ, it sort of like it shaped my way. Like that shaped my life. Finding Brazilian Jiu Jitsu shaped my life, and the quit drinking and all that like led from from that experience. Yeah. Okay. Mm. So what happened from from that incident and and coming home to them finding Jiu Jitsu? So how did you find Jiu Jitsu? Well, how did you just find you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's what it's more like. Um, so from from the incident, it was I was flown straight home, um, and then you, you go into because out there, you know, I know some people don't know what it's like out there, so it's a bit of a it's hot. You, you're sort of you, you're eating four thousand calories a day. Sometimes um, you're working hard, and you're in the heat. You're carrying all the kit, yeah. but then obviously you get injured. And then you just stop. So then, but then all your family comes around and supports you through that injury stage. And, but I still kept eating the 4,000 calories a day. <laughs> and especially because the food out there was no good. And then when you come home, you know, the food is good. I was about um, to say, I must have been fucking lovely, wasn't it? Coming yeah. home. Yeah. Oh, coming home, there's <laughs> coming no home feeling that. like it. There's no feeling like it. Um, and yeah, so I put on a bit of weight and stuff. And then to get out of that stage, I thought, right, I need to set a new goal. And that's when I thought I'd, do, I'd become a PTI, a uh, physical training instructor. That involves just training, say, 30, 30 guys, and, and you basically, you're in charge of their, their training program. You'll, you'll set up the circuits and, you, and you'll, you know, do the strength for them, do the, the sort of the, all their fitness needs. Um, and as you lads probably know in the gym, you have some banter back and forth. Um, we used to have some banter with one of the PTIs there. I was always a little bit faster than him, always a little bit stronger. Um and he trained BJJ, so he was a uh, purple belt. Um, he's still trained now. I think he's just got his black belt now. Um, and he was like, come and train with me. And I was like, well, it looks a bit strange. Because, <laughs> you know, for, when you first hear of BJJ, like you just think of like karate or, mm. or something like that, especially from an outsider. And now I'm in it. I can't believe I never knew about it. But at the time, I was like, okay, show me what it is. He said, what? And I said, what belt are you? And he said, oh, I'm a purple belt. And I thought, well, he's not having a black belt. He can't be that good. So someone said that like, to me today. They were like, someone said to me, oh, how did you go get, get on last week? Yeah. And they were like, oh, you're a black belt. I was like, Pfft. <laughs> <laughs> I was like a fucking white belt. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? And they, they look at you and feel like, what? what? But they don't yeah. understand like no. how fucking long that would take you to get yeah, a black belt. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so it was a crazy sort of... Um, like a, a thing for me because I like I thought like the majority of people well I'm stronger I'm fitter yes. he's not a black belt he can't be that good let's let's just roll and um, we had like a squash court in most camps and they've they've got mats in there now which is awesome um, and we just rolled for the hour and he literally just filled me in for the whole hour he like choked me he just which. Looking back, I don't think I would do it to like an intro coming into a gym now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you'd think that, wouldn't you, mate? <laughs> Is he going to your Oh, team? mate. Oh, God, no, fucking hell, got me in the cage and just raped me for an hour. <laughs> do you know what I mean? Absolute lies, mate. I don't. <laughs> <laughs> he's, he's still at this point, right, where he's a white belt. Yeah. And everyone's still just being nice. Yeah. Fucking no. And his yeah. first taste of, of real jujitsu was in his competition oh, the other weekend. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, it was. Yeah. He's, quit. he's quit. He's quit. He's, he's, he's chucked his gear. Oh, he's, <laughs> he's still in, but <laughs> fuck your gear. Nah, yeah, wait, wait till the blue belt blues get you, mate. Yeah, mate. Oh, yeah. The come come yeah, yeah. Get, get, your blue, get your blue belt, mate. All the white belts try and prove a point. Yeah. <laughs> All the higher belts don't hold back anymore. All the other blue belts are trying to get one up. It, who's holding back on me, mate? Because you fucking don't. Yeah. Mate, you'll be <laughs> like, surprised, like, mate. I'll let you get your blue belt and I'll, I'll, I'll come and talk to you again about it. Sorry, mate, as you were saying. Yeah, so I, I think... So, you, so he raped you. Yeah, he raped me. But, like, 
I think that's what I needed because, yeah. you know, it's a strange thing when, when people get exposed to that, they're either like, oh, nah, this ain't for me. Or they're like, wow, this is amazing. It's like open your eyes up. And that's what I got from that. I was like, how did I never know this was a thing? Because even, you know, being a council kid and growing up from, you know, Birmingham for all across the country, I believed I was tough. I've, you know, been to war, done all that stuff. In my mind, I'm like, oh, I can handle myself. I'm a pretty tough guy. And then you get put in that situation and you don't know anything. I'm like, oh, mm. this is crazy. This is so that I just got addicted to it from there. And uh, yeah, did my first competition three weeks after that. Yeah, so playing that, <laughs> that strain of the defense. Yeah. Um, before we get into your, I guess your journey from that point. Yes. Um, just want to touch on the real charity a little bit. Yeah. And I know not, you're not hugely involved with it, but. No. I think personally, and I think maybe Danny's the same, I see it a lot, especially yes. in the Southwest. Yes, which is great. But I don't actually know that much about it. I don't no. understand the role they play, but I believe they, they use Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu to support with like mental health of, of ex-military guys. Is that is that it? Can you explain that real quick? Yeah, that, that's correct. Um, Sam, the founder's done an awesome job. I mean, now they're expanded even into fitness and, and it is for veterans, but they're also helping everyone. They're helping everyone at the minute. It's such a, an awesome organisation. Um, they've sponsored me for like some of my competitions and... Um, and just the work they do, I'll always push that because what they're doing is, I personally know some ex-veterans that have served with me um, that got out, like if, you know, say five years ago, there's many barriers to training, as you know, family, kids, work, and money's one of them. So what they did last year, I believe, it was last year, um, they sponsored people. They said, if you're ex-serving person or somebody that just needs a membership, contact us, let us know, and we'll sponsor you for a year's membership, which is a massive thing, mm -hmm. um, and gave people that that chance to, to, to get back inside. The, the, the guy I'm talking about, I don't think he'll mind me saying, Paul, um, he he was actually a blue belt um, training way before me. But then, you know what it's like? You, you get lost sometimes across that path of jiu-jitsu. And, and he got lost a little bit, came out and was working, had a good job, and but he was drinking quite a lot and had kids to raise and struggling a bit. So I contacted him, said, look, Ryog's doing this. Do you fancy coming in and, and testing it out? He said, mate, yeah, I'd love to come in. I said, let's get involved then. And, and now he's been training with us for like a year. He's just achieved his purple bow and uh, he's just a different character. He just doesn't drink that much anymore. And what people don't realise is, yeah, it has effect on that individual, but that individual's got children, that individual's got a wife and it just has a ripple effect across that whole sort of system because even his kids now have got a different sort of father and they'll be different kids because of that. So the, the real charity is a, a, a great thing and I, I, you should get Sam on. Sam would mm. be... Awesome to have one. I think Mark's coming on soon as well. So yeah, yeah we'll talk yeah. more about that then. Yeah, sounds like an amazing cause, mate. Mm. Yeah, awesome. So, so you get your ass kicked. Three <laughs> weeks later, you're competing. Yes. And how do you then go from, I guess, having your eyes opened? Um, I'm sure the competition was probably a bit of a shock to the system as well. Yeah. Um, so how do you go from, I guess, finding jujitsu for the first time, competing to then, I guess, getting that kind of sponsorship from the army to then do that full time? Yeah. So, um, the army is a strange one because the sponsorship is important from army sports, but it's more the unit support. Um, I'm, I'm pretty, pretty good that I've got a good name within my unit. Um, even though I'm, I'm, you know, I'm only one rank up and I've been serving sort of 14 years. All my peers have overpassed me now, but I've served with a lot of my peers. So they know what kind of character I am and, and they know what kind of individual I am. And, and luckily enough, I have a good name with them guys and they've always supported me. Um, how did I get into the competition scene? So after, normally what happens with like boxing or any kind of sport in the military, they'll just put it out there and say, so they gave me three weeks off. So they've got three weeks training. There's going to be a competition called the Army Championship. So I was like, oh, okay, three weeks is quite a long time to train full time. Yeah, this is what I thought oh, I at the start. <laughs> yeah, I, sh I should be able to do well in this comp. Um, and it was not the case. And it was, just, I just got sat on um, trying to mount, trying to just bridge the guy off, but I was just bridging straight up and down, burnt all my hamstrings out, all my glutes. Um, but then again, you know, I, I knew that I, I needed to learn the mount escape uh, because that's something that wasn't in my game. Um, and I was lucky at the time being a PTI, you're busy, you're a physical training instructor, you're busy when you need to work, but then when you're not to work, when you're not busy, you've got a lot of time to sort of train. Uh, it's one good thing about the military is, yeah, when you've got to work, you work. But there's sometimes in the military when you've got a lot of downtime um, and you normally do physical, uh, you do some kind of PT in the morning, 
in the afternoon would be some kind of lesson but the, you know you're away from the family or whatever for that whole week period so I just trained trained early in the morning trained in the evening um, and did that as well as my normal role for like a year um, and during that period your bosses can see that, that you're working hard and I was competing and then started to win a few local events and, and get the name out there a little bit and, and say thanks to the army for giving me the time to compete um, and then I won the Europeans at White Belt uh, 2018 so you know, the Europeans 2018 came back and I was I was about to get out of the army and they said look you've won the Europeans you're doing really well what if we give you another job which involves uh, a little bit more work but you'll get more time to train because really it's consistency. It's not the 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 trouble was with, with some of the the forces training is you're away for two or three months and then you'll come back for a month. You can train for a month quite full on and then you go away again. But whereas we all know that it's consistency over a long time. Um, so they gave me a nine to five job. I was in I was in a recruitment role, and over that recruitment role. Um, the same I could train constantly for two years and I was winning more and winning more and then when I got to the end of that role they were like okay you, you know you should qualify for elite sports status now how and many then, how many competitions was you doing along that time like how often were you competing it, and- I, I was doing at least one one a month I would say or one every two months it's hard to to, to recollect how many I've done but I, I've done so many and um, but I, I we can go into the top of the, to the competition training sort of stuff it's I use it as part of my training, like because I've used the example just now about competitions. Most people at competitions they'll they'll wait to the end of the white belt to compete, and then they'll wait to the end of the blue belt to compete, and then they wait to the end of the purple belt. But by the time the time you get to black belt, you would have competed four times. Whereas for me, I'm competing every other month. So by the time I get to the end of of white belt, say it's two years, that means I've competed twelve times, and then there's five belts. So by the time you know I've made it through there, I've competed nearly fifty times or whatever. So you can see how that progress sort of just highlights um, highlights any weaknesses in your game. Also gives you focus. Like you're used to it. Passion, you're used to it, and that's you're massive, it. isn't it? Like yeah. you, you're used to that surrounding of going in and yeah. fighting. It's, it's, yes. It, yeah, and I think for, for people listening, so when you say you've competed 50 times mm-hmm. or you would have competed 50 times, that's not 50 matches, that's 50 tournaments, right? Yes, yeah. In each tournament, you might have, well, anywhere from two to six plus matches. Yeah. So it's a lot of bouts. It is, yeah. Yeah, it's a lot. Um, we'll, we'll get into you competing a little bit um, more in a, in a, in a sec. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to ask more about the training, actually, because I, I, I've been around jiu-jitsu for years, mm-hmm. um, way longer than my, my belt suggests. Um, but I remember when, like, I think it was the Royal Marines created the Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu Alliance. Yes. Um, and I, I don't know, you know, what the timeline was with the other armed services mm-hmm. kind of getting on board with that as well. And that was, that was years ago now. Mm-hmm. Um, but quite often they would bash each other up at the barracks they yeah. then come down to the local gyms yes. bash us up um, and that's kind of how it went <laughs> yes. um, but I feel like it's probably a really good setup now in regards to the training so when mm. you say you were training for like three weeks like what's the calibre of guys that you're on the mats with like who are the instructors is that is that an army training or is that now do you mean in army training so okay. so that's kind of work along the timeline a little bit so when you first started when your white belt started getting into the elite sports status yes and then kind of around there and what that looked like yeah so it was a difficult stage because i was in exeter at the time and um the guys down there i don't know if you've ever trained there they're absolutely awesome gym full of killers they're all like marines as well so i just i was getting filled in all the time um but you know that made me defensively good just that aspect of, of getting filled in quite a lot. Um, but for that, what I was doing then is is I was work, I was living in Exmouth and I was working in Exeter Town Centre. Uh, at that stage, I was able to train quite a lot. So I would like cycle, do, do a CrossFit session, believe it or not, in the morning. Then I would cycle into work across the uh, the River X. It was like 12 miles in. I would, you know, maybe go and be in the office for a little bit, do whatever job we had to do. And in the evenings, then that's when sort of my main jiu-jitsu would sort of um, take over. At that time, it, it wasn't um, it wasn't established. In in I, I mean, the the bosses now that are in charge of the of the army team have done a, a great job, and and they've made me sort of. Um, to IC of the team now, which is second in command of the team. And we're running uh, training camps now. We've got all this system set up and it's such a big organization now. But I remember when I first started competing, 
you know, five years ago, it was just such a small um, part of the army. And because it's not an Olympic sport, it's tough to sort of um, still grow. But it's, uh, you know, if you look on the mats, it's, it's a massive sport. And we've got a sort of um, loads of people helping us from like Hodger Gracie for, you know, training camps and all sorts of stuff. So mm. that's awesome. Yeah. And also being part of the army team, I, I, I'm i lucky enough as, as well as competing I can turn up to like Hodger Gracie's Academy for his comp training if, if you know, because I've got the army gi, okay. I can come to like most camps or, or around, around the country and they're all super friendly. So that's how I, I, I gauge, you know, the, the competitions is, is one thing, but I do find sort of training in different gyms is, is massive for me. So I, I was training in Exeter and then when I came home, I would train in, in Plymouth as well. And I would just try and train as, as many, as many places as I can. And even if I got sent on a, on a, on a recruitment event away for a week or two, I would just Google sort of the, the um, local club and I'll just be there like trying to stay on the mats as long as I can. Yeah, that's good. Cool. I think we, we touched on this a while back. I think it was with Toby randomly. He's not a jujitsu guy. But okay. He was just talking about, he dances yes. and he was talking about how like it's almost like a universal language wherever you go. You can rock up to a local dance school, or in our case, a jiu-jitsu school, yes. and just rock up and, and train. And I do it a fair bit as well. So I travel to London quite a mm -hmm. bit and train at Hodge Grace Academy up there. Mm -hmm. And I think it's really cool having that ability. But I think it, yeah, I think the fact that you travel quite a lot with the military must give you so many opportunities to train in different places and get different perspectives on on training. Yeah, definitely. And and some gyms, like some gyms, don't like people traveling, um, which you know everyone's everyone's the way they are, but. It being an army gi, they're like, yep, yeah, come in, train with us. And it doesn't matter if it's a Gracie Baja or whatever kind of gym it is, uh, you know, they're sort of, they are welcoming. And now it's grown so big that we've got our own sustained training. Um, and luckily enough, work gave me the time to, so I can sort of really focus in on that and, and train pretty much, you know, quite a lot, quite a lot of time. Yeah. Mat. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sweet. That's awesome, man. It's just cool. Um, so I think we want to get into like your, your journey, which yes. I guess is going to include things like your training regimen, mm. your training split. And then we want to chat about your competition. Um, and because you're so prolific in, in competing, um, I imagine that you probably go in with, you know, having had a, a proper camp with particular tactics and, and approaches to, to competing. Yeah. So we want to find all that out if we can. So I don't know which way you want to talk us through that, whether you want to talk through the training and then leading up to competition, then the competition tactics and psychology. Yeah, that's that's probably the best one. Well, I, I seen yesterday what you put on Instagram about yep. your fucking your day of training. Yeah, mm. it's fucking nuts. It it does seem nuts, but then if if, if you in a, in a good way, I was, yeah, I I was reading mean. it like lucky fucking. <laughs> do you know what I mean? Like yeah. being able to do which, that, which is, is you know lovely. everyone, uh, you know I've got the best job. Uh, yeah, without right, doubt, right, yeah. doubt. But it, it is a job as well, and it's one of the like the hardest jobs I've ever done. There's no other job that I've um, worked this hard at. Um, and what people don't see is is it's like it's not so much the um, it's almost like when you start lifting for the first time and you're seeing those PBs and you see you know you, you're, you're hitting one each week and it's like yeah okay I'm getting stronger blah, blah. and then after a while they stop and then it's like small changes that is going to occur over it's the grind the day to day grind is the most difficult part of it. And there's ways that you can sort of approach that to stop that happening. Um, yeah. But what people don't see is, is that kind of, apart from my wife, she sees it because I'm always oh, moaning at her if I'm <laughs> ever like out or injured or whatever. Mm. It's a tough job as well, as well as it, you know, you, it's, and, and even though you, you look at my day and it's, it's busy, if we bro broke it down just to one session, you know, you drill in for 45 minutes maybe or say 40 minutes you're drilling then you're doing like 20 minutes sort of from a, from that position that you've just drilled like leg lock and stuff yeah and then and so you but then you might do say one round at the end of that hour or two rounds at the end of that hour then you're going to do like a leg lock session like it was yesterday just focusing on on those well for me my weak areas i'm very lucky the gym at where i am have sort of let me put these in in place and um and how, and sort of like help me progress that way. And then what was it next? It was, then it was the re, the prehab stuff, uh, which is you know if I'm doing this level of training, I I can't miss those days. So that kind of stuff is, is um at the minute taking care of my knees, uh, taking care of my lower back and like that whole spinal column. I think is massively important for BJJ. Um. We, we spend a lot of time in that crunch position. We're using front abs, using hip, hip flexors quite a lot. You, you actually, you, you don't spend a lot of time coming back out of that. And if you spend a lot of time doing guard, 
you're always in that country position and also you develop well are you know you you will develop eventually is pat and you're always doing the same so you, you you'll get off like off balances so at the minute sometimes i crunch this way quite a lot because i play guard on this one side which means my ql and all this side is super strong this side means that i have to get up and i have to do more reps on this side at least 50 reps every morning um, so you got to like, I have to do that prehab work, but really I'm not going to the gym and lifting, doing heavy deadlifts or that's just like, a few... and it's energy levels though, isn't it? As yes. well. Like if, if you're training that hard for that many hours, I don't know what it's like. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you just can't do it. Yeah. Yeah. You, yeah. Know, you just can't, you haven't got the energy. It, it is structured though. So it's not, it, it seems difficult, but if you're eating throughout the day, it's not too bad. And then at the end of the day, I think oh, I went back and actually done the 10 a.m. class gi class again is the same structure you're just doing the gi class and i think as you as you do get more efficient through the bouts you'll probably know this is you, you don't use that much energy you end up actually some of my sessions that i do i like 300 300 calories on my because i wear my, my whip whenever i train but it's not that much output f for me sometimes and i've got to i've got to sort of keep an eye on that because you, you can get a bit lazy and so use the wood that pound yeah, I've got the band, but you also got the. the I was about to say, when they bring out like a fucking sleeve, yeah. that's what you have I was to wear. Looking yeah. at that yeah, the other day, it, it looks yeah. fucking awesome, doesn't yeah, it? Like you can't wear that. Obviously, you can't. It's too pointy to wear. But the the, the actual armband's super good, and it yeah. gives you because what I've I've used quite a lot of things. I've used the polar de devices, yeah. the garments. But the issue with that is, is you're not wearing it all day. You're not wearing it at night time, so it's not tracking your calorie count all day. So you don't know what you're burning. And um, with this whoop, it's sort of tracking you all day. Yeah, that's good. I've I've, I've got a Garmin which you wear the watch, and they do have like an integrated chest strap. Yes, so it doesn't pop off nice so I've worn that a few times training but I still find that it's it's still like a solid object yeah you run that across yeah. someone's yeah. eyebrow yeah because yeah. the whoop thing's quite a bit it's associated with CrossFit quite a lot isn't it? Yes. that's how I first knew about mm -hmm. whoop how all the CrossFit athletes use it don't they to yeah. check out expenditure yeah. yeah which is the same for BJJ like I need to know like am I am, am I recovered today well, that's just for your calories yeah calories you know what is I mean? important to know yeah. That, you know, <laughs> yeah you're getting enough energy into well it's uh, especially at the start because to, to be honest I wasn't eating enough at the start I, I was I was training a lot and not eating enough um, and when, when I seen like a nutritionist and he sat me down he's like what, what are you eating show me what, and he was just like your carbs are just nowhere near where they need to be you need to be having a lot more carbs for the amount of training you're doing and as soon as I put that into my diet, I was like, wow, that's such a big change. But I went through nearly two years where I wasn't really eating enough, apart from probably weekends, I was catching up there. And mm. um, this is when I was sort of 74 kilos. And I was getting injured all the time. It was Boy, miserable. I'm about 88 now, a bit, a bit more chub on the old belly but that's a, that's a big difference in fairness isn't it like 74 to 88 yeah. like competing wise well, yeah because like, well, yeah, I remember when I, I first when you first like, dropped on my radar on social mm. media and stuff seeing you competing yes. yeah you were you were yeah I think we if I was lean mm -hmm. I'd be in the same weight bracket as you now yeah. I think and I remember you were maybe two or three weight brackets lower mm -hmm. and obviously during the last five years you've yeah. you've gone up quite a few so so it kind of makes sense why yeah you and, eat more. <laughs> yeah well and I, I do think is you know you, when I first started this job excitement was in there and I was like right okay I'm going to be as shredded as possible I'm going to try and do as many comps as possible but then after like a year or two you realize that it's longevity it's yeah. longevity on the mats and if you want to be there for a long time you can't be going in there you know not with any energy with low carbs you, you've got a lot of work to do and you've got to fuel that work yeah. and you've got to fuel the recovery as well which is massive so the, the carbs and the food is like massively important and I get this question quite a lot about weight cutting for competitions and all this stuff and I don't think it's the way forward not when you all. say weight cutting you mean dieting down or water cutting yeah well everyone always so say the average person is say 85 would yeah. say they always want to cut down to 82 mm. but it's 82 with the ghee yeah. So really it's 80. So yeah. you, what, you're going to cut down five kilos in three weeks and you're going to up your training and you're going to try and like take in new information and then you're going to weigh in on the day already in that depleted state and then you're going to expect your body to perform till it's at maximum ability. I'm just like compete at 88. Yeah. I mean, I'm I'm not 88. I'm probably about 84, 85, but it, it, it'll range from, from 86 to, to 84. And I don't, but I don't even have to worry about the scales. I don't even worry about the weight. Yeah, I think it's really good advice actually, because I've had these conversations with people before. Mm. And as I mentioned, when I was leaner, I was competing at medium heavy. Yeah. Now I, I definitely wouldn't be there, mm -hmm. but there has been occasions before where I was borderline with the weight and turned up 
I think it was like maybe the British Open. Mm -hmm. So it was an IBJJF tournament and rocked up very borderline, went up to the scales when I got there. Yeah. And they were like, yeah, you wait, on before, you wait before you get on the mat, mate. <laughs> so I literally had to spend the whole morning like dry, not drinking, not eating. No fucking way. That's what, well, literally as you yeah, go on. Yeah, pretty much. You go into like the holding pen, you weigh, and then is you're that, like, right, boom, straight out. Is that what they do now or is that? That's everywhere, yeah. Standard, standard across yeah. across the board that is. Um, and that's why it's just it's just no good oh, to I cut down know. for me. Cause it's just, you know, a, a lot of people, I think, that have the mindset of, I want to be the best white belt or the best blue belt or the best purple belt. But but really, when when you're coming in, you got to think to yourself, I want to be a good black belt. It's not about being a good white belt or even like, even my medals that I've got, it's like, they don't really mean that much. It's just like, for me, it's, I've always tried to imagine, okay, how do I get to be a good black belt? And how do you get to be a good black belt? You need to spend a lot of time on the mats. And if you're going into training, you're hungry and you're not fueling your training, you can't take any new, you can't take any information. Um, you, you, I was, when I was 74, I did that for two years um, and I was miserable at home. And my wife was like, you need to eat. And as soon as I eat it, as soon as I eat, you know, everything felt better. I, there's something to be said for being as weird as it sounds. I feel like there's something to be said to, for training hungry and I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't recommend it, but it's almost like, the smaller guys in the gym are always the most technical it, because they're, they're, they've got no energy. They haven't got the, the muscle to sort of, to, they, you know, to pull off what the big guys can. So they have to be the most technical. And I think sometimes when I was training at the start, I was doing so many hours that, because you imagine every every session that I go to, the, the guys are coming in fresh. So if I'm doing a 6 a.m. session, everyone knows when that 6 a.m. session, they all, they're all like, oh, well, let's try and tap him out, you know, or whatever. And then, it's, that's throughout the day though so I see people at 10am they're thinking exactly the same but they they haven't they, they've been resting as well so I've already done that work three hours before so I'm pretty tired already and then I'm coming into that session and they're trying to come after me mm. and after a while what what, what you you, you get te technically um, proficient and I mm. think that's like key for longevity yeah yeah 100% um, so on that you just talked us through like about three sessions in a day yeah and you've you've kind of touched on i guess some of the splits and the various components of your training mm -hmm. so like per day like how many hours of actual mat time do you put in on average <sighs> do you think in so a week? okay I, i'll probably go on to this but i, I love maths I, I don't love maths that's wrong okay i, I hate maths I, got <laughs> I was gonna say no one likes maths yeah, what yeah, are you yeah. talking about <laughs> i got like an f or whatever in maths um but i love to see the numbers and how it stacks you like, up you like over a long time you like data. I, I just like to because I'm basically doing anywhere from like 20 to 15 hours a week, um, maybe even more sometimes. Okay. And I'm not saying I recommend this for people. Um, and as I said, some of those sessions, and when I'll talk you through the, the, the way it's structured, um, as in like intensity wise, some of those sessions are not really that difficult. Um, but the average person is probably doing anything from three to five hours. Yeah on the mat each week so i'm four times that so if you imagine that if we expand that over the, over a week it means every week that i'm doing is an average of a month of someone else who's training every every one month of me is four months of theirs it doesn't sound too bad until you start getting to the years so if you do years year one for the average person compared to my mat time is four years for me and then you get to the five year period five years for me on that mat time is 20 years of mat time for the average individual and that's mm -hmm. where you can see the gap starts to grow and that's why i like to do the maths and do the numbers and as i said it's not always like full-on in intensive sessions mm -hmm. but um i mean you must know yourself after a while you, you get to not the top of the club but you get almost comfortable in the club and you can it's not taxing you too much but you're actually going for your game you're repping it out um but my my weeks are structured that it's sort of um it's, it's planned in the sort of sensible way if you know what i mean yeah no it's, it's an interesting statistic because i think as i alluded to earlier i've been in jiu-jitsu now i probably first dabbled in jiu-jitsu it must have been 17 years ago such a long time ago <laughs> yeah a long time and for the first couple of years it was it was very like half ass training and i yes. got a little bit serious and there's been probably like like maybe sort of two or three year periods at various points in that time frame yeah. where I've actually trained a little bit more serious. Mm -hmm. But even when I was competing in MMA, 
not like a high level, but like yes. semi-pro. Mm -hmm. um, I was, I can remember working out back in the day as mm -hmm. you've done. Mm -hmm. I was back then doing MMA, I was only doing 12 hours. Yeah. And that wasn't 12 hours of martial arts. It was everything. Yes. So that was skills, training, S&C, everything. Mm -hmm. But outside of those acute periods where maybe I was training for a fight, you're absolutely right. I was probably training maybe three, five hours a week max. Mm -hmm. So I think you're spot on. I think that is probably what the average person trains. And that was because yeah. I worked Monday to Friday, nine to five. Mm -hmm. I wasn't in a position like yourself where you're very fortunate where yeah. your employer yes. like supports your training. Mm -hmm. And I can remember there was a period definitely ages ago when I was, I'm not obviously the, the, the sharpest tool in the box because I was like, I don't understand why people are getting so much better and I've trained longer than them. <laughs> and it took me a while, as silly as it sounds, yeah. especially when it was back in the day and it was still a bit new to, to get my head around that sort of stuff. Yeah. But actually I've been training 15 years, say, three times a week, mm -hmm. four, well, three hours a week, five hours a week. And don't ask Kenny, because he'll tell you I've trained fifth, <laughs> three times in 15 years. <laughs> but the last couple of years, certainly I've barely trained at all, is the truth. Yeah. Um, but then you've got someone like yourself, who, you know, you've surpassed me in belt ability, everything, mm -hmm. in such a short period of time. But it makes perfect sense when you explain it like that. Yeah. So it's a really interesting point that I think a lot of people probably just wouldn't think about. Well, it's... it's it is simple maths. You're yeah, right. Yeah. As well, for Ricky, it's, it's a fantastic opportunity that he's been able yeah. to do mm -hmm. that you yeah. earned mm -hmm. through, mm -hmm. through being good at jiu-jitsu, obviously. Yeah. But then yeah. you've taken that and you've just not, you've ran with it. If yeah. that makes sense, you've ran with it big time. Yeah. Which I'm fucking really jealous about. Really. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, a lot, of people, I mean? are, a lot like, of people are. But I, best, I guess going back to the theme you said, it's like a job. And that was an interesting point as well, mm. because there's occasions like I've talked about already where I can't be asked today. I'm not going to train. I don't train. Yeah. Or something else comes up and I prioritize that and I don't train. Mm -hmm. But I always get up and go to work. Yes. Like that's never, that's not a negotiable. Mm. Yeah. I get up and I go to work because it's yeah. my job. Yeah. So I guess with you, even during those periods is there's lots of motivating factors wanting to get to a black belt, having the personal intrinsic motivations, but equally if all they, all, all they fail, you can still go, I still my fucking job, I still got to go to work. Yeah. So you've also got that behind you and as also, well. And also, is there pressure from the army to st for you to still do really well? You yeah, know, at a elite level. Like, so if you, if you start dropping losing. off and losing, yeah. would they then say... Yeah, definitely. I mean, you know, for, for people to get elite sports status for, for, for like a year is not, not too rare, to be honest. But to get forget it to five years is, is really rare. Is that but, how long you've had it now? Um, I've had it probably about four years now, officially. Um, but as I said, they put me in work uh, jobs where they sort of give me time before that as well to train so I probably had elite sports status for about three years but you know I think before that they were giving me can that, extra can time that carry well. on after five years or it is can it some, yeah as I mean, long as you're still winning I, yeah I guess, that's and... the thing is every year it gets re like almost renewed or, or, or looked at again and you know that's why I have to take it so seriously for, as a job and um, and it, it is a fantastic job and I, I love it but also I've you know, I, I work really hard at it. It's not like... Um, Do you feel the pressure from that? Yeah, because I, I, like I've got a family, I've got kids, yeah, course, you know, yeah. and it's the, the normal military job, I'm away. I'm, I'm not really home that much. So and, so at the end of every year, I'm not too sure what's going to happen. So in that year period, I've got to know that, okay, I need to try and at least uh, medal at like a big comp if I can. Um, and I always do think that pressure like sort of helps you out a little bit because it does sort of give me that that progress to push forward. I mean, my honest opinion, some people that would be put on elite sports would be doing sports and would, but would they be getting up and doing five hours a day? Would they, because the thing is, you know, I'm a Lance Corporal, I probably earn about 30,000 pound a year and I've had to sacrifice career because of this so I've had to turn down money I've had to like I've not been on holiday for like I've been on a few little holidays but I haven't took my family on holiday for five years I don't drink alcohol anymore um, it's such a selfish thing that I have to do sometimes to be an elite, elite sportsman but obviously that has a ripple effect on, on my family as well because I can't just say oh let's take two weeks off and go to wherever because that's two weeks off the mats and I can't afford to have two weeks off the mats so yeah, it has a, it's a it's a job and a job I, I love. Um, but it's as you said, it's a job. And yeah, I've got to treat it that a, way. It sounds like a bit of a double edged sword, really. That you can yeah. do something that you love, yes. which is you know rare, really, in this day and age, yes. especially. But then you've got the other side where you have to keep performing. You have to keep at it at all times. Yeah, and also, then... yeah, and you've got you've got to turn down stuff, other opportunities like promotion. You've got to turn down, you know, and they've offered me pr promotion before and. The, the trouble is, is, is as you go higher up in the army, the more valuable you are to the army. 
So if I'm higher up, are they then going to leave me and let me go do sports for a year? I'm not too sure. Mm-hmm. Um, so, and you know, I've got bosses where I'm honest with, and I'm like, and they've asked me, do you want to do this promotion? I'm like, I'm really focused on this competition. I really want to push the sport with, um, within the army. I want to help it grow, get it into, especially the infantry is there, units. Is there any other uh, world champions in the army? At yeah, there's, there's quite a few. And that's why it's not just the sports scholarship that you need. You need the, the backing from your unit. I'm in the rifles um, and the rifles have been outstanding with the time they give me. And I've got some leaders and bosses in, in the rifles that you know some of them I was on tour with but now they're like they've gone right up the rank and they're almost officers now so one of them now is currently my boss and um he's he's sort of said to me like where where do you want to go with this and I've said to him what I want to do these are my plans and he said yeah well we're behind you we will support you with this and I think that's uh it's not just being um good at jiu-jitsu you know you've also got to have a good unit you've got to have the work ethic you'll have the family that supports that as well because not all families like you know i was a white belt when i went back to my wife and said i want to do this for my job I, and she was what like, did she say she, she was, was just like mental, what do you mean she? what do you mean you want to do this for a job i was like i think this is what i want to do for my job and um, because before you know when, when you have kids i don't i know you've got children have you got children yeah, as well yeah, yeah so, so so you know what it's like when you have kids that's when you really want to settle down and and so I, I was looking at different job aspects and I was already doing a um, physical training instructor and I thought maybe I can do this. And then all of a sudden I came across jujitsu and I was like, nah, this is what I want to do. This is what I want to do. I'd yeah. fucking love to be able to go and tell Karis, Karis, I'm giving up, I'm <laughs> fucking doing jujitsu. <laughs> do, you, do, you know do you know what though? I think you know, my, my kid's like three um, mm-hmm. and I, I found actually that, that have, having him come along it did the opposite actually. It didn't want me to, it didn't, it didn't want me to settle down at all. Yeah. Like it actually like really kicked me up the ass. Because I don't want him being 18 and me just, you know, having like a normalish job and, you know, just not being an inspiration to him. I think you're exactly right, yeah, with what you said there. Yeah, and in that sense, and that's what it did for me. Having the, the you know, having the little, my first boy, Noah, um, that's when I quit drinking. That's when I just started to look at myself and think, right, I've had all these experiences in my life. What like what do I need to do now to be a good dad? Because yeah. I think that's like, you know, the, the goal. And obviously I want to be a good husband as well. Yeah. But I think as as parents and I'm sure my wife would say the same that she wants to be a good mom yeah, and course. bringing up that child so yeah I think you're right that's when you start to sort of look at things and went back and said to her I want to do this as a job and she was like what does it involve and I was just you know we sat down and I explained to her well this is the maths you know it's going to take me about five years to get to the point where I need to be to sort of earn a little bit of money from it it's never going to make us millions but what it is going to do is going to give us you know, happiness and all that kind of stuff. Um, and we're going to have to sacrifice holidays for a little bit. We're going to have to sacrifice money for, for a while. And she was just like, yeah, go for it. Go mm, for it. That's awesome. Mm. Yeah, that's, cool. that's great. That's great that she can do that though, because, you know, big shout out to your wife, really. Yeah, yeah, because yeah. Not, yeah. not everyone would, mate. You no. Know? And yeah. I've been really lucky where Cassie supports me and loads of the shit I've that's done good. over the years, mate. I've done loads of different fucking random businesses and all different stuff. She's always nice. supported me with that. Yeah. But you can imagine there's a lot of blokes out there that just don't get that support or don't have that support yeah. where it's, you know, very money orientated and then, you know, they're, they're not able to do it. Yeah. You know? But then I would say, you know, are you in the right relationship then? Do you oh, know? 100%. Yeah. <laughs> because but again, like, like how many, how many blokes though are, are, are like that where they go, oh, I can't come to jiu-jitsu, mate. Wife won't let me. I hear all the fucking time. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Like I understand to a certain extent because you can't take the piss because you still got your kids you still and everything got, else. Yeah, but, bills to pay. But realistically, if you're in a good relationship and you, you know, it's, it's good for your fucking head, isn't it? It's yeah. good for your head. You that's the, that's it's good the, for your yeah. fitness. It's good for everything. Like, yeah. It's not like you're going out on, on the piss. No. And, and at the pub all weekend and do you know what I mean? And Just, she's, yeah, she, yeah, and she sat at home doing nothing. You know what I mean? It's a bit of a different. I think you're, you're yeah you, you've hit the nail on the head with that one. I think it's um it's important to be supported by your partner and also also support them as well. So she's at university now. She's quit a job, um and she's doing what what she wants uh, to do for for like her her sake. Yeah. So I think yeah it's definitely it's the key aspect from that is to have a supportive partner. But as you said, if you know you've got to make money, you have got to make money without a doubt. Yeah. But if jujitsu is going to make you happier, it's going to make you like. I've, I, it's a hard one for me to, for, for my wife to understand that sometimes I have to say to her like are you training this week for an example if that could be either physically trained or whatever oh, I'm not too sure if I can fit it in I'm like you need to fit this in for you because if you don't do training then you know you're you're gonna like not be happy yourself 
and then it's going to have a knock on effect on the whole family. It's, it's yourself first, as weird as that sounds, as in like health and, and especially mental health. And then it's like, oh, the others around. Once you're in that stable position, then you can help out more people. You can be you can be a better wife. You can be a better husband. I, I feel like that's such a. I don't think you should ever get lost in the money, uh, not at all. And, and I know it's hard. It's one thing saying that and another thing doing it, but I've, I've done it for five years now. I, you know, I've, I've got the same car that I've had for five years. I've, we've like, we've, we've downgraded our house. We've like moved closer to the school. We've like done so much things to like sort of say, right, okay, let's put everything on, on, you know, on hold, work at some skill for a long time and just see where it gets us and spend time with the kids and mm. do that kind of stuff. Yeah, so I guess in addition to the the actual job pressure or motivation, I guess there's a huge bit about that as well. Then, right? Because if if your your family have made all the sacrifices to support you, mm-hmm. and you start losing, yeah, or start failing at training or whatever, yeah. then and again, that's another reason. So I think, yeah, you've obviously got the time, but I think that motivation must be yeah from some mo- from so many different places must be really helpful. Yeah, definitely, and, and as well, like yeah. you said, when you go away. Mm-hmm. you know actually being at home yeah that must be just fucking that oh must yeah be huge just being able to be yeah. home see your kids every day your wife you know that's, that sort that's of stuff. the dream for me like if i yeah, come home it, yeah. and if i can see the kids that have tea from every day yeah. that, that's that's a win that's a win for me but we were talking offline before we before we started recording about purposeful training mm-hmm. and and you obviously mentioned you know a, a, a minute ago where you know training 20 hours a week and um, we've talked about the different motivations that you've got yeah um, and i think one of the other things that that can make somebody excel really quickly in jiu-jitsu as well and tell me if you agree or not but it's not just the mat time but it's the thinking time as well yeah and i, I talked to i think i might have mentioned this to you already so i did a degree fairly late in life and you do your degree do your lectures and they're almost like your, your classes yeah but then they tell you right that the, the real learning is in the self-study mm-hmm. so here's like a little piece of information here's yeah. a technique yeah and then you should go away and give it some good thought go watch some tape on it grab a partner, go and drill it. And that's where you really refine the movements. Mm-hmm. And I find when people train as hobbyists, they might only just have three or five hours, but outside of that, they're at work, they're with the kids or whatever, and they don't have the ability to reflect yeah, um, and really think about what they would have covered in that time as mm-hmm. well. So I feel like for somebody who can train full time, that's a really big benefit as well. It's not only the actual hours on the mat, but it's the ability to actually go, right, let's think long and hard about this, let's reflect, where could it improve? Would you agree that's a benefit? I think so, yeah, uh, massively. It's a, there's a few things in that in that sort of um, piece there. I mean, what so what I did at White Belt when I first started training, mm. because what I think most people expect is, okay, you're going to turn up to the class and they're going to teach me this technique and I'm going to put that into my game somewhere. And then each class is, yeah, okay, it might be a syllabus, but say if you're on, I don't know, half guard for six weeks, then you're only going to learn that half guard kind of thing for six weeks, which is the perfect way to sort of learn. But what, so what I did is what a lot of people do is they go and they'll look at YouTube. They'll say they'll have 10, 20 techniques. They'll be all in their brain and it's just too much to focus on at once. So I just set an alarm on my calendar every month. It would change and and the alarm would be guard and submission. So it would be question mark on each. And then, so I'd pick one one of them and it'd normally be something I'm working on. So say if it was a half guard that I'm working on that month, I'd write down half guard. If it was a, a submission, it'd be a Kamor, for an example. Then if I'm going to study anything, it would just be on, ha- it would be on half guard and it'd be on Kamor. So that's all I'd study that whole month. Then the alarm would go off whenever it would go off. And then I would check, okay, have I, do I feel like I've learned enough about half guard for, to move on and do I feel like I've learned em- enough about Camorras and probably no alright so then you do another month but you'd super like focus in on mm. those details people expect to turn up to a school and just be taught something and then to take that away and, th- and they're going to learn so when you say that you focus on that so even when you're rolling you're looking to get those moves yes. if that makes sense you're yeah. looking to get into half guard and then sweep or submit from from there or then or like hunt in the Kimura. Yeah, is that right? Definitely, yeah. Yeah, definitely. not just like, you know, dead drilling them, if that makes sense. And yeah, yeah. That. yeah, but that's what I mean by that, that comment about purposeful training. Mm-hmm. Um, I think it's not just showing up and putting the hours in, it is doing exactly that type yeah. of thing where you're analysing your game and then applying that to your training. I think mm-hmm. that's really important. Um, and I guess with that as well, there's probably like a, a, a mindset piece about that. Yes. Because I know when I've been trying to isolate certain positions, 
like it might be side control escapes mm -hmm. means you've got to let people put you in side control yeah and you might not get stuck there for a whole session <laughs> so did you how did you find that in the beginning like overcoming that that where you you know you, you're going to lose as a result yeah in training um if that's even such a thing but mm -hmm. you know what i mean um working on those specific positions did that was that like a struggle for you in the beginning yeah it not really because I just got put there a lot anyway. Okay. So like I, I would try and work my thing when I could. And, yeah. and then I ended up in side control a lot. I ended up getting choked out from the back a lot. I ended up in these signed positions anyway, quite a lot. So over two years, like defensively, that builds up automatically anyway, for me personally. Yeah. I know some people structure it different. Um, so I focused on what I was trying to learn and that would be just driving to the gym. I would be, okay, what, what submissions and stuff am I looking for today and what kind of guard am I working? And because sometimes in class you would cover those positions anyway, side control, mount, and then you're going to do them anyway. Um, and then when I drove home, it would be, okay, did that work? No, that didn't work. Maybe I need to study that for a bit longer and what didn't work. I, I find that, um, you know, for me personally at that beginning stage, mm. I just, I was already in those bad positions quite a lot anyway. Yeah, okay. I was there, I was being put in there, I was being. So like my defensive skills were coming to the level of a white belt anyway. Mm. Not at a, a black belt level, you know, but I think if you, once you start to progress higher, yeah, that's when you sort of need to sort of like do that more was specific. There, was there a moment you felt it click your jujitsu a little bit? You know, you're sort of talking about two years of defensive, yeah. you know, sort of. Was there a moment where you thought, actually now I can put my pressure, my game onto someone rather than being, you know what I mean? Underneath and being beaten all the time, just for all the white belts out there, like me, <laughs> you end up getting battered. You know what I mean? Is there, is there like a point where you, you know, you, you feel like your game changes at some yeah, point but, and you but, become uh, the more, you know, the one who puts on the attack rather than, yeah, the one, you know, but, uh, being the hammer rather than the nail. Definitely. <laughs> but like, honestly, it, like I was quite strong and, and fit white belt. So sometimes that would be the case anyway, but it's probably no technique there at all. Mm. But I, I, I didn't feel comfortable and find that sort of flow moment on the mats until purple belt. And it was purple really? belt during competition. Yeah. That's when like, that's when I thought, well, well, there, this is this is something that I'm getting good, good at. So at that point, you must have done, I don't know, when you were saying earlier, you must have done like 70 competitions yeah, before that I mean, even. <laughs> did, you know I, I mean? did win competitions, but then, you know, I won white belt competitions and I did, I won blue belt competitions. It's not, I don't think, until you get to a purple belt, like that's probably the mid stage where you can sort of, you can handle most people and then you can start to develop your own game. It's hard. Like even if, even if I won the Europeans at white belt, I'm still going to go back and you know, my coaches are still going to kick my ass. So yeah, it's like, say, not like, get a good blue belt. That's still probably beat you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know I mean? Yeah. Like 100%, club, yeah. yeah. Without a doubt. And that's like the, the way you've got to approach it is you never feel like, Oh, but you know, I, I'm, I'm, and now it's still the same. Now I have glimpses of like, Oh, I feel really good. And then next week I'm like, oh, I feel shit again. What, like what have I done? Especially going through the injury process quite a lot. It's like, I used to think at white belt, it was like, oh, blue belt, purple belt, bright, and you're going to constantly go up. But the truth is really ups and downs. And it's the, the line is gradual and it does go up, up over time, but it's just ups and downs throughout that cycle. So, so with, um, <clears throat> what you were saying about sort of in the beginning, you find yourself in those positions in a way. Mm -hmm. Probably not, probably less so now. Now yeah. you're, you know, sort of competitive brown belt, um, you know, and a lot of your peers and training partners now are, are probably lower belts, less experienced. You'll probably, as, as we always do, still come across some absolute killers. Mm -hmm. But now you're at the sort of higher end of the belt um, journey. Do you now put yourself in bad positions? Because I know it's something that like Hodge is famous to have done back in the day. Kenny even talked about it a little bit as well, where yeah. when you, you're surrounded by lower belts, mm -hmm. I know you've got black belts and stuff locally who you train with. Yeah. Um, but do you now go, right, actually, I want to work on, you know, sort of bottom escapes. Yeah. And do you just allow lower belts to pass you to then work from there? Or do you still do your best to defend it? And if you end up there? Yeah, it's, it's a strange thing because, you know, looking at this, I'm six years in, so, so I still don't know the answers. And, you know, f do do I let l lower belts pass my guard? Yeah, and I'll let him get to my back and then I'll escape the back position. But then what happens then for me personally is I, I end up developing sort of a placid game where I'd let people slip past my guard, take my back. And then it sometimes would happen in competition because I'm training with, say, lower level people quite a lot, not all the time, but quite a lot that um, 
I ended up being that kind of style of jiu-jitsu. So yeah, I, I do end up doing that. And I think maybe later on, I will go into more sort of um, structured stuff like that. But at the minute, I'm just trying to expand my my game. And like even if I'm, I'm doing well in the club, you know, I can get people down and, and my coach can, Ian will always, will always humble me. And then if not, I can travel and go to places like CF24 in, in Wales and, and any place like that where the guys there just kick my ass. So like, I'm still putting those defensive positions, but defensive positions against high level people. Yeah, so okay. like, they're trying to control me while I'm trying to move, but their, their level of control is a lot higher mm -hmm. than say, if I let a white belt try and control me from, from side control, I feel like, they can't stabilize the position enough. Whereas if a high level black belt puts me in side control, I'm stuffed. So, and that's going to happen because I'm still learning. I'm still there. So I still get that pressure tested mm. um, all the time as well. So I think yeah. that is important to get yeah. that pressure tested, but I'm always for me trying to expand my game. So we can talk about like my mapping and stuff mm. and that, if you, if you want to go into oh, yeah, that. Definitely. Yeah. I'm, I'm, yeah. Well, I was about, to, I was about to ask, cause I think, you know, you've got quite a unique situation, as you said, mm -hmm. and there's, I guess there's a lot of uh, younger lads maybe who don't have a lot of responsibilities who might be in a similar position from available time to train. Yes. But I think a lot of our listeners, me and Danny included, are you going to be the, you know, the kind of hobbyist or, or even if we are purposefully training and competing, still part-time competitors and, and part-time training? So I was curious just to give people a little bit of, I guess coaching wisdom yeah um in regard to if you are just training maybe sort of three to five hours a week mm -hmm. um you know you're still at a sort of lower belt rank you know how you you know how you kind of split your training especially if you're a bit older as well yeah i mean danny's sort of early 30s but you know i'm 40 you're mm -hmm. late 30s mm -hmm. so we're all getting on a bit and we've talked about injuries and we will talk a bit more about injuries a, a bit later on yeah so i guess you know you're a you're a sort of bloke in your 30s 40s train three, five hours a week, fairly newish to jiu-jitsu. Like, what would your advice be for somebody staying injury-free, uh, progressing? So you talk about mind mapping, so the thought around training, but also the varying intensities of training throughout the week as well. Yeah, okay, it's, it's, it's a vast subject there. Big question. Yeah, if we start from like white belts, if you started today white belt and you're, you're middle-aged, what I see a lot of, um, especially if you're not already fit and robust, is people come in and they'll try and do all the sessions they can. But really, you want to start off slow because it's just a matter of time before you get injured. And then you get injured and then you're off the mats for a while. So I would say, you know, do two sessions a week, build that up slowly. And then you would have to sort of take a look at some kind of like strength and condition around that as well. Maybe not at the start because the jiu-jitsu is quite intense. Um, but if we then went on to somebody else that's sort of stagnated in their game or, or their position, it's about identifying weaknesses. Um, competition is great for that because you've got somebody coming at you full pace um, and if you if you don't want to compete and then you can find it in hard sparring at your club or you could even find it at traveling as well so there's a few options there for you for me personally I have to try and build a game I think a lot of people um, put their onus on their coach to sort of structure their game and, and sort of say okay teach me jiu-jitsu but really it's the same, I think, in a lot of industries, like even with the, the NHS or even with fitness. It's like you, people expect their doctor that's going to see him for two minutes to give him some kind of pill that's going to sort out something. And really, you've got to take the charge of that yourself. And it's the same with PT, PT and physical training. I see sometimes people are looking for some kind of magic answer. You've, you've got to research that stuff yourself. So I'll build a game. And how it looks like and what it's structured like is I'll start off and say bottom bottom say i'm on the bottom my partner is kneeling so then i'd I'd have that as the middle um section of my sort of spider diagram and off that would be set guards so from the bottom and they're kneeling what guards can i get to can I get to butterfly guard i can get to half guard that's the main two from there i can get to close guard as well so that would splinter off from different diagrams and then from each one of them say from half guard example it should be a sweep or it should be a sub, um, submission. If it's not a sweep or submission, it means you've got nothing from that aspect of the guard. So then let's just say it's a Kamora. A Kamora is a perfect example because it's a, a submission and the only way to escape is to roll out. So it's a, a submission and it's a sweep. So you either get the submission or you get the sweep. Let's just say that you get the sweep. Then you end up on top side. Then top side would be a separate diagram. 
top side would have all my submissions that would come off it on that side and when you build this game it takes it takes a while for you to sort of write down but then when i'm going to class and i get taught an x guard sweep i look at my okay where can i fit x guard in i know when i can fit x guard in is when i'm on the bottom and they're standing i can't really fit x guard in when when they're stack when they're on their knees and i'm on the bottom or if i'm standing so if i was working on x guard I got taught an X-Guard sweep. I had nothing on that diagram to put on my X-Guard sweep. Then I'd write that in. That's my X-Guard sweep there nailed. And then you want, you know, ideally each one of them would have a submission or a sweep, as I said before. And it takes a while to like build that game. But each game's ind individual. As you mm. said, like I'm short and stocky. So I play like a pressure game that's in tight. You're a bit taller. So you might play like a, a wider open guard, okay, with your legs around. And, you know, you might play a, a stockier pressure game just like myself. So that means you need to work on sort of pressure passing and whereas yeah. his would be different. And yeah. then expecting your coach to be like, well, I've just taught this one lesson that's tailored for everyone. It's not really going to work. You've got to take that onus of yourself. And then that's when also what I put on that monthly calendar of what am I working on this month would be a hole in that game. So say if I had nothing from a half guard, I'd be like, I need to work on a sweep from a half guard. I need to work on a Kamura from a, or whatever, a submission yeah. from a half guard. What you're saying there though is really good. But, from my point of view, I don't even think I know all the different sweeps, submissions, blah, 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 blah. So like yeah. just even listening to you there, I'm thinking in my head, I'm thinking, right, to do that, I actually need to go home and research and know what a lot of them are. Yes. You know what I mean? Because definitely. like, you know, I know what X-Guard is, but do I really know how to get into it properly? Do I know at what point to get into it? And I know that's obviously comes from experience yeah. and mat time, mm -hmm. but even speaking to a lot of people on the mats and stuff, a lot of them, they won't even know. You know, if you say like to a, to someone, oh, get, you know, De La Hiva, they'll be like, oh. Like. But it's, it sounds like it's a, it's a working document, right? So yes. a working job. So you'll start with one thing. Yeah. And that spiders off by the sound of it. Yeah. And then you learn something new like X guard and you're like, mm, what the fuck is that? And then what can I do from X guard? Yes. Yeah. And then you'll plonk that there. That comes yeah. off at here. Yes. There's your branch. Yeah. And then you've got a few bits there. And it, it just seems like, yeah, from what you said, that you just start obviously with one component you build up as you go which is really interesting yeah. you become yeah. systematic with that if that makes sense so like say you then like if you get someone to hack on it triggers a series of things like in your head 100%. then you're like this is what i'm going to do if i can't sweep him then i'm going to go to the kimura if i kimura sweep him over you know then and then do you control. automatically then like drill that into your brain to a point where it it's got to work and if it doesn't work then you move on to the next part that should work yeah because what what you'll find as you said it's difficult when you first start but what you'll first start with is top and bottom so you'll yeah. you, you, what do i do when i'm on top what do i do when i'm on bottom that's, what I do, that, yeah. that's, that's all it starts yeah, with yeah, and it's me, like yeah. i'm on bottom i get to close guard yeah that's a simple do i know a sweep from close guard no i need to find out a sweep from close guard and eventually what you'll you'll find is okay they've based out from close guard as i say for an example um and they've got a leg that's sticking out so you can get to X guard. So then you're like, okay, the sweep doesn't work. And what's happening when I get that sweep is I'm managing to find a way to X guard from that sweep. And then your X guard would then be built around So did that. you used to make like little notes about this? Or like, was it all like, just yeah, just, just, just like at the end of the thing, you'd be like, oh, you know, I, I fucked up this from X guard. I didn't yeah, know where to go from there. It's difficult for when you first start, you said you don't yeah, know all that stuff. Yeah. So it's really hard when you first start. But like after a while, like I knew, okay, I like to half guard from the bottom. I knew on top, I like to pressure pass. So I, I knew just those two things. So then I'd work on sort of something else and it would slowly sort of build up. And it's you can get apps like it now where you just literally put it in an app and it's just on my phone. And then I can go to a gym and visit somebody and they'll show me a technique. And I'm like, oh, I wonder if I could put that in my side control game. I wonder if I could put that submission on my back game or... So yeah, it just takes a long time to build, but I do think it's... Um, it just helps you see the holes as well because then when you're it shouldn't one of these gaps shouldn't shouldn't have a no ending on it so it shouldn't be like okay i get to close guard but i've got nothing from close guard because if it is nothing from close guard then you need something from close guard remembering that you want to be on top or whatever mm, yeah makes so it's sense. Sort of, and then it goes round again doesn't it it goes round again yeah, yeah it goes round again break, and then break close guard go into side control exactly. and then you're back into that cycle yeah of, yeah of exactly where. and and like mine will be different to yours or whatever and also what you'll find then is is like most of my stuff's from half guard so i know like a lot of my stuff, I want to fit. I want to end that in half guard because I have like an A game, a B game, and a C game. 
going to get a bit complicated now, but... No, do it, yeah. I'll <laughs> fucking love it, mate. Yeah, go on. Um, depending on, like, the distance, you, your game should change. So if they're a bit further away, then that's when you need, like, a, a, a wider, say, um, Delaheva or... I know people... Do you reckon this is good to go into? because no, people. No. Okay. They, they can Google it, mate. It's fine. Okay, cool. Yeah, you'll need, a, a, a like, a further away guard, should we call it. Um, and then as they get closer, you'll need something that's a bit closer. And then they get closer again, you'll need another closer guard. For an example would be X guards. Uh, let's just go with the geese. So we do spider guard. They get closer. I can go to my half guard. They get closer again and get to my deep half. But from each one of them, I should have a, I should have a, a sweep or whatever. But what you what tends to happen and will happen is you'll favour one, you'll favour a half guard. So then you want some of your stuff to lead back to the half guard because you know that's maximum where you get most subs from. That's where you spent most of the time. That's your A game. Then you'll have like a B game and then you'll have like a C game. So it's difficult to sort of... Um, this is what I fucking love jiu-jitsu yeah, so it's just, much uh, it's too. Expanded, it's like it, it fucking expands, keeps going, yeah. love it. And I think that's what made me fall in love with it is because it's yeah. different to like lifting or CrossFit when it's just like, you know, you get to sort of that top peer of that, then it's like, oh, you've done it. But with this, I don't think... I, you I really enjoyed CrossFit. I said it a couple of times, but mm. my, my biggest thing with something like that is not skill acquisition. As soon as you have a bad injury and you're off for three, four months... Yeah all the fucking work you've you've done in CrossFit for the last year can be undone really quickly, mm -hmm. you know? And then you're, you know, you're battling back from injury. But with jiu-jitsu, you, you acquire those skills. And even if you do have time off the match, you don't lose it completely. Do you have any sense? Yeah. You, you've you always got it there, yeah. you know? And and you, you're gaining that, you know, that knowledge all the time. And then like you, like where you've had a gap, if you now consistently started training for, X, you know, another year, mm -hmm. You know, you you you've not lost all that stuff that you've done, yeah. and that's what I really like about it is that you gain that, and it doesn't really go away. You yeah. might have to sharpen it. I, I found that it, comp it compounded a little bit over time, actually, because I, I probably had periods off at all the belts that I've got to so far, and probably the biggest gaps were blue and purple belt. Yeah. So blue belt, I had a, a, a couple a string of really not serious but pretty severe injuries mm -hmm. that kept me out for a while, and I can remember it was a period when I came back at blue belt. And there was literally certain positions that I came back and I was like, I don't know what to do here, but I can't think. And it took a while yeah. to pull that shit back out yeah. of my head again. Yeah. And not just the knowledge of what I need to be doing, but also the reaction and the timing of what Muscle I need to memory. do as well. Muscle memory of it, yeah. But then with Purple Belt, I pretty much had two years off um, during the pandemic. And... And that was I, when I came back then, and that was definitely the longest period with nothing. Because even at Blue Belt, when I had that period off, I still hang around the gyms a little bit. I'd still watch. I'd still do some really light drilling. Yeah. But the two years during the pandemic that I had off from jiu-jitsu, like complete nothing. nothing. Yeah, first time for 20 years, probably no martial arts at all. Um, and I found being a purple belt at that point, I compounded it enough up to that point. That even when I came back after two years, I felt pretty good. Yeah. I still felt like it was like there. Mm -hmm. But the timing... The, obviously the conditioning the mobility isn't and that's where I'm now trying to that, that's the battle that I've now got yeah. is that in my head I'll be in a position I just put my leg there I fucking can't <laughs> <laughs> so I'm having to work on that shit yeah. so that, that's the issue for me so yeah it's, oh, a, mate, it's, a, it's a really fascinating approach and I think for a lot of people I think it'd be really helpful um, and that was exactly what I meant when I said about the uni degree your lectures and then your self study yeah because it is a job just building off of that that really basic work. But I think having that that kind of structure to your learning, I think is really good. Um, and then in regard to the actual intensity of your sessions, and you touched on it a while back already where you said that certain sessions, you don't really burn many calories mm -hmm. at all. Mm -hmm. And you said if you're a white belt, and that's maybe moving on a step, you're now a blue belt. So you're a little bit more conditioned, but you are still getting on a little bit um, and you want to maintain obviously your longevity and you train, I don't know, four times a week, say. Mm -hmm. Would you would you recommend like picking certain sessions to go harder in or easier in? How do you normally manage the intensity? Yeah, so what, what I'll do is I'll, I'll talk you from my program, okay? That's just like a elite sports program. And then I'll, you, you can like, you can tailor that to how, because some people might train other, they might lift as well, and that's all going to play a part. But it, the, the system should always work the same. It's the same when you lift. So for me, let's say I've got a competition in six weeks. That's written down, one to six. Um... And the same, Monday to Friday is written down the same. Okay, so my hard days is always a hard day. My medium day is a medium day. My rest day is a, me a rest day. Active recovery day, we'll call it. Um, and it's simple as that. So Monday is my hard day. I do my hard sparring. I, I do quite a lot of sessions and I do my hard lifting on that day, all in one, which sounds insane when I first when I first uh, like tried this. Yeah. 
Um, but what happens is, is then the next day is my sort of medium day where I'm going to do the same intensity, but maybe I don't spar with my coach Ian because I know if I spar with somebody that's high level, I'm going to be put into that sort of zone where it's hard. And then my Wednesday is like an active recovery day. So maybe that day I will spar still, but it's a, a, a lot lower intensity and it's no um, no lifting on that day. Maybe some prehab work, it's sauna work, it's stretching, it's mobility. Then Thursday, we go back again. That's my hard day again. So that's when I'm going to do my lifting. I'll do push on a Monday and say pull on a on a Thursday and I'll do my hard sparring on that day Friday again that's when we take the tempo back down Saturday goes back to active recovery Sunday sparring get back getting back for ready for um for Monday in that as well my, my weeks are numbered one to six say if I've got competition so week one would be like okay getting into this training program let's take it steady week two is like let's pick the pace up Week three is leave no stone unturned. You're just going to die this week. Just suck it up. It's going to be shit. Okay, but you just <laughs> got to get through it. It's just that's the mentality that you need for that week. Week four is the opposite. Okay, if you can't spar hard on that Monday, don't worry too much. If you're not killing yourself on the weights, it doesn't really matter. More of a tapered off week. Uh, week five, pick the pace back up again. Week six, taper off and then compete. And also in there as well, I do like to do some competitions in there because... Okay, the, the, the competitions, is, I'll go back and forth with my trainer, Adam, with this, is um, the competitions are, they are hard, but sometimes I'm doing like three or four rounds, which is like 20 minutes of work. So like, it's not too bad for me. And if I'm not tied to the outcome of those small competitions, yeah. they're really good for goal setting for the big competitions. So sometimes I'll just put in the, the local competitions and, and the other comps because I'm not really too bothered about if I win or lose on those comps. It's just really for, to get me ready for that big competition on the big stage where I want to be hitting that stage, knowing that I've done everything I can to sort of compete at that level. Yeah. So if you are a blue belt, you know, you can structure that around it. So it means if you're busy with work, pick two days where you can sort of maybe try and get your lifting in and your and your training. I know it's difficult to do that with time constraints and stuff. So it's just that you just don't go to the jiu-jitsu practice on a Monday, lift heavy on a Tuesday, jiu-jitsu practice on what because then your body's not recovering and any of that is you're just literally put you you know if you have the weekend off and then if you do an open mat on a Sunday, you've got one day of rest that whole week. It's just a matter of time for your burnout. Yeah. Yeah, I was surprised when you said heavy jiu-jitsu and lifting on the same day but yeah, but yeah it does make sense and you've explained it like that and you said you do push and then pull do you do like legs as well do you do yeah. full body yeah well it's I'm under um, my trainer Adam just yeah. he, he sort of like writes a program for me yeah, it's okay. like I could do it myself but it's just nice to have somebody there that's like you know, he's been in the business for years now. He's like, you don't have to think about it, mate. That's what I say about, to yeah. people. You just go there. Just turn up, yeah. yeah. He's got it all sorted for you. Yeah. And that's, that's the biggest thing, isn't it? It for, is. For a PT, you know? It is amazing. And it's that accountability. Yes. Having that accountability. Yeah. You know, if you were not, if you haven't got him, yeah. and I know you're really regimented, but even still, you might think, oh, fuck it, I'm fucking knackered today. I can't be asked. Mm -hmm. Whereas you know, you've got to go see Adam. Yeah. So it's like, yeah, no, nah, you're not going to be lazy fucking today. We're going to do Po, and it's, you know, and that's that. And when you do, when you see you do heavyweight session, um, what sort of, um, sort of ranges are you working in? So are you doing like, are you doing like Olympic style lifting? Are you doing power lifting? Are you doing hypertrophy work? Yeah, he, he structures that. So as I said, I don't really think about it too okay. much. Um, but if we're doing stuff, it's, it, it's hard because you'll see all these fancy programs out there for like, oh, improve your jiu-jitsu with this. But mm. all of my games in jiu-jitsu are made on the mat. And even all my conditioning is on the mat because I do so much training. It's like, I don't need to go and do a run or do whatever. So we keep it super simple. And like, we've been working together for so long now. And plus he's been training for so many years. It's, it's nothing fancy. It's just the simple stuff, but it's just for a long time. So the push and the pull ones is where, really where he pushes me on, say, a squat and a deadlift, but it'll be more of a suitcase deadlift and it'd be more of a um, squat, it'd be a box squat. And all the other training is, is pretty much, you know, there's some stuff in there that will change and mix around. But a lot of, like, I'm in the gym and like, you know, I've been up the nut field and wherever, gym most days, but... I'm not doing the strength training. So I'm doing training still, but I'm not like pushing myself in, in, in those areas um, unless I'm doing those two sessions a week. I'm still doing, I'm still lifting on the other days, but it's not it's not lifting heavy or it's more for that prehab sort of work. Yeah, okay. And you, I think you just kind of answered it there, but cardio, mm -hmm. 
do you just leave that to the mats? Pretty much? Um, yeah, but now w what I've found is as you do get more efficient in your movement, it's harder to sort of get that. I mean, I remember being a white belt and coming out like, oh my God, I'm dead. And just thinking, because I did CrossFit for a long time as well. And I was like, well, this is just the same as CrossFit. But now I don't finish a session like when I used to do like a CrossFit mm -hmm. session. It's, it's not the same intensity for me anymore. There is structure to it. So that, that Monday session that I was talking about, that's when like I'll meet with my coach and we'll say, okay, we're going to do three 10 minute rounds and we just go at each other. We've never injured each other. It's always like, you know, we tap fast, but I know he's going to try and kill me and I'm going to try and kill him. And it's like, because that's what we need for that Monday session. Um, and that's cardio for me. But what I have been finding re recently is the zone two cardio has been helping me out massively and um, stuff like the. What, what does that mean for most people? So it's just, a, it's a weird, it's a weird cardio, which I don't know if you can actually call it cardio because you're not actually out of breath that much, but it's just a slow, steady sort of the step master. I use that quite a lot or I use a bike or a salt bike and I'm just steady pushing it through and I'm trying to do it for past 45 minutes yeah so is it zone two is that based off your rest your heart rate yes yeah so, so again percentage of with match the, heart rate. yeah, yeah so okay. again with the whoop i've got that on the phone whoop, yeah you just must keep an eye on yeah. it yeah just keep an eye but, it, but it's steady but it's steady state cardio yes yeah. yes yeah and, it's and, a really good way it's a really good way to um to yeah. build that up yeah it, it builds my recovery up strangely enough and there's also you can sit in the sauna you sit in the sauna with, with my whoop on my heart rate's elevated for like for a good half an hour to 40 minutes mm. in the sauna and I'm not moving. I'm drinking electrolytes while I'm in there. Um, and same on the bike. I'm, I'm just staying, it's, it's, you know, it's the most boringest part of my, my sort of um, workout, but I do find that it, that's having more of a, a, an impact impact. And I do think for longevity wise, stuff like but it's like how, how do you fit it all in do you, do you, oh, yeah. can you do two hours of uh it's like do you know what i mean zone two training a week can, can you do jets and mm. then strength it's hard to fit it all in yeah i've been looking at these um like these bike desks on, oh yeah yeah that you can like <laughs> paddle and then you've got like a little desk on there yeah. as well i think i need one of those these days yeah yeah so you can do much. zone two and answer emails and all yeah, that as well so dream <laughs> awesome um mate let's let's chat about competing a little bit because you've you've given us tons in regard to the training and yes. like how you structure your, your skills skills that was and everything else um but it'd be good to hear about i guess training tactics because obviously danny recently did his first competition i've i've Wee. done plenty over the years and i've definitely been guilty of before just rocking up with a competition and just see how it fucking goes and yeah. i know that's the wrong thing to do and whenever i've thought about it a little bit and gone in with a bit of a game plan i mm -hmm. always seem to have done a bit better so it'd be good to chat about that um before we do just again for people watching um, can we just chat through like the structure of, of jiu-jitsu competition? So I guess uh, the different belts, age, sort of age and weight brackets. And then I guess we've talked about like regional and then the bigger ones. Yep. Um, yeah. So you've got from all different belts and yeah. um, then you've got all different ages. So you can do masters one, masters two. I compete in masters two now quite a lot, which is 35 plus, which is a massive bonus for me. <laughs> um I'm trying to do some adult competitions now um, while I'm still a brown belt because the adult black belt division is just insane. I've mm -hmm. done the maths and the maths is not in my face on that one. <laughs> <laughs> These guys are killers. Um, yeah. But we'll see. We'll see if we can do an adult one at black maybe. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, so we've got different age categories, different weight categories as we talked about before. Um, and the local ones are just like local tournaments and then the, you've got national ones yeah. and then you've got world ones. And you've also got different kind yeah. of stuff as well, Europeans. And, and I try and do the, at least two big ones a year. Yeah. And then uh, all the national ones if I can. And then the local ones as well, if yeah. it fits in my training schedule. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So I think you mentioned earlier the, the regional ones are more kind of feeder ones into yes. the, the big ones. And then also just to confirm that the, and again, we've touched on it already, but the tournament style is like it's bracketed isn't it so it's essentially mm -hmm. a knockout tournament yeah so you might go in there might be 16 people in your bracket and it's mm -hmm. like a quarter semi-final yeah and that type of setup cool um and interesting you mentioned about the adult and masters thing actually because mm -hmm. it, it seems like a lot of the big stars in jiu-jitsu like are always in the adult division yeah and i was going to ask you actually if if you'd considered competing in the adult division because that's typically where you get a lot more of the um kudos i guess yes and the recognition yeah so have you, have you competed much at adults in brown belt? Um, adult brown. Top of my head, I don't think I have. I did sign up to Devon Open adult brown, but yeah, okay. the neck injury pulled me out. I've got mm. the 
the army veterans adult yeah. and i've got the real guana adult yeah. as well so as an adult is my push for this year yeah okay um especially at the the, the national level yeah you know, I'm realistic in what I can achieve and, mm. and how long I've been training. You know, a 31 year old started at, we started a white belt mm. at 31, you know, adult black belts. They sometimes start at seven or eight and <laughs> oh, you no. know, they're just like for years. So yeah. it's for me to catch them up. Um, do I think it's possible? I don't know. I don't think yeah, it is. It's not tough, not a black belt. Brown belt, I think I can achieve it. Yeah. Black belt, I'll give it a go and, and we'll see and we'll see what happens there. Yeah, because it just again for, for viewers' benefits, so adult is eighteen to thirty. I believe so, yeah. 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 And then thirty to thirty five is masters yeah. one. Thirty five to yeah, forty is five year gaps. Yeah, so I it's, think most of the like local comps though they just mix them up, yeah, especially the higher belts. Because there's not enough, I think. Yeah, yeah especially you're the right. higher belts they just mix them up. So yeah. I have competed against some some adults. Yeah. I did, actually, well, I did I, compete. I, I went to adult just in that yeah. lo local yeah. one of them because there was no one, no one in masses. Well, I really. did compete adult actually yeah. uh, three weeks ago, and they were bigger as well. They were ninety four <laughs> kilos, okay. and that's how I sort of got a little bit of a neck injury, <laughs> won it. But yeah, I don't yeah. Know if you can cast it a win if you come back with an injury, I don't think so. Wow. Yeah, I don't know. But that, so I think the, the, there's two real components I find with that, isn't there? There's the actual, I guess, the, the, the actual sort of the, the usefulness of the competitors. Yeah. So like you, like you say, you get now like 20-year-olds and they might have been training since they were kids. So they're absolute killers. Mm. So like you haven't got wisdom on your side necessarily. Yeah. Like you say, because you started like five, seven years ago. So yeah. you haven't even got wisdom. <laughs> yeah. And then you're against these kids that have got the same, maybe more time on the mats, but they've got these fucking bodies yeah, that we can true. only wish for these days. Yeah. Um, and I guess the other thing as well is is around the ability to train more. And I guess you do have that advantage. I do have that advantage. And I do yeah. think with age comes strength as well. So yeah, I, okay. I think from like, you know, some... 21 year olds they, they you know i feel like if you've been doing strength for 10 yeah. 15 years oh, you've yeah, got a definitely. bit of an advantage there yeah, yeah. Mature, old, man, old man strength old mature man strength. muscle yeah. i call it yeah. mature and muscle because i can train a lot <laughs> as well yeah that's what it is yeah all right yeah cool sweet so so yeah so you've you've got a competition so let's say it's one of the the important ones mm -hmm. so you're really focusing on mm -hmm. it and you've talked us like briefly through like the the six week camp so let's not get into that but in regard to actual tactics game plan psychology can you tell us a little bit about that yeah of course so i've mentioned it before about a sort of a game b game so you know most people they just go to a competition and be like well i'll just see what happens i'll see what happens but if you look at the stats it's that like <laughs> <laughs> it's all of us at the yeah. lower level it's all of us because and also the, the the knowledge is not there yet to sort of put it in and also the pressure just competing is just like horrible yeah it was yeah yeah, yeah it was um but the stats are like, I think if you score first in IBJJF, it's like 80% chance that you're going to win. The point system I didn't like when I first started because I was just like, well, it's, you, some people just play for the points. But then what I've realized over time is points dictate control. And then what I've developed now is a, a game where I can control somebody very well, um, which then does lead to submission. So the points thing is a bit strange, but what I would say is you work on your A game. So if you're going to competition, you should know what the, what the first thing you, you're going to do is, and at least that should be, are you going to pull guard or are you going to take down? You can guess most big guys want to want to take down and be on top. Most school, most small guys are going to um, pull guard. So if I was a big guy now coming into it at white belt, I would just say, well, if I just learn the guard, for four years don't get tied to the outcome of these smaller comps or any white belt competition don't even worry about what you what you medal what you don't medal on those work on your guard for like five six years and then you pull guard at like brown belt against another guy that doesn't know that much guard and because it's hard for the big guys to train against other big guys that have got good guards they can train against smaller guys with good guards but not big guys that can sort of generate the same force as them Learn guard is just like Gordon Ryan's done really. Gordon Ryan's was small in the start, um, technical obviously, and then now he's like <laughs> insane <gorilla>. jacked, yeah. <laughs> and he's got a technique behind him as well. Yeah. So if you notice on most comps that he does, he's you know he lets them take him down, and then he plays guard. Yeah, and so you can sort of structure your game around that. Um, but all of us we get tied to the outcome of those smaller competitions or even the the big competitions but a lower bout so most big guys will try and take down but they might win that takedown battle in the gym because they're normally training against smaller guys i've seen some most competitions with big people they just 
headbutting each other for like five minutes. And I'm like, oh, come on, just show some jiu-jitsu, please. And then you get the other aspect at the bottom where they both do double guard pulls and nobody wants to stand up. Be like, one of, one of you just take the... Because you get an advantage for standing up or taking top position if you both do a good double guard pull. Okay, I didn't know that. But one of them mm. won't take it because they both know they're better on their, on their back. Yeah, so it's a strange yeah. situation to be in. I think middleweight's like the perfect sort of tactic. So you should know exactly what you want to do there and then take down all, all guard pull. If it's a guard pull, it should be into that A game. So into your A guard, whatever that is. And then you should know those two sweeps that we talked about before at least or two submissions and it should just follow that spider diagram. Um, if it's a takedown, you know, you should hopefully take down to some kind of control. So a side control or mount. And then if it's one of them, you should then know your game from that position. Mm -hmm. Um, so that's the tactics I would do approaching it. Um, but the, the truth is with competition, sometimes the guy before you is, you know, hasn't cut weight and, and you've cut weight. So he's got more energy than you. He's got a buy and you've just had a battle a minute before and then you're back on the mats again. The ref's on his side and not on your side. So some of these competitions, like you can plan and try and develop all these games and systems in place, but some of them, it's just not your day. It's not your day. And, and the truth is, you just got to compete for a long time. And I do think it's, it's the, well, you know, I've gone from white belt to sort of blue belt and achieved quite some good medals there in a short amount of time. But I only think that's down to sort of um, competitions and stuff like that and just keep doing it, keep showing up, keep doing it, keep pushing hard. And eventually you'll get good. It just takes a long time. Yeah. Okay. As you know. Um, one thing I see a lot of lower belts and well, everybody, to be fair, in my opinion, certainly coming from a fitness background, do wrong is warm ups. Yeah. So, what's your warm up routine? Okay. For when you compete. So, um, my warm up thing is it's hard now with the local ones because I'm chatting quite a lot to people and I'm if, if I'm helping out coaching or whatever. But for the big ones, I've really got to switch off. If I'm competing, I don't go there first thing. If I can help it, I'll go there two hours before. So I'll go there two hours before. I have my headphones on. I'll find a quiet corner somewhere where no one like can come and talk to me, and I know I'm safe. And I'll try and to like get my head down or sleep. The preparation starts the day before with what I eat, like a carb load and stuff like that. But when I get to the um, event, I'll just find a quiet corner. Then after that, I know you can normally watch it on your phone now or in the big events they got on the TV screens. About an hour before. I'd get to the warm-up mat. I'd just do some kind of general warm-up. I've got one where I need no one or I've got one where I've got a partner. Mm -hmm. And that normally takes 15 or 20 minutes. Then I spend 15 or 20 minutes stretching and then I'm back in the pen. Um, it's hard to try and do that warm-up after that because you're on in like 10 minutes and then you're back in the pen and you just... Yeah. Do you get like a proper sweat on though? So I try to, because, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, it's a weird one because I feel like even though I compete quite a lot, I've still not um, nailed it on the head yet. And I do feel like probably getting more of a sweat on would be would be better. I've I've managed to like find let's call it flow in like two or three competitions, and like I've done without. And those competitions are like pfft, like they're rare. And when I say two competitions, not for the whole competitions, it might be for like two or three rounds on that competition. Yeah. But when you find that, it's just like I wish people could experience it because it's um it's magic. It's and, magic. It, and in between the fights, um. Or the matches what what do you do in between to keep warm do you re-warm up do you you know what i mean like yeah, yeah i know what you're saying do you keep active in between yeah because um, yeah. sometimes like you know the, the one we've done i, I had a I had my first mm -hmm. one was at like 10 and my next one was at four yeah, yeah. I, I see that like six hours <sighs> yeah i see that well i think there's there's two questions there potentially because i think i, I see that people warm up and they go into like the pen i guess mm -hmm. and then they might be there for ages yes and then they'll go and compete and then they've got a gap then so they win. They then got a gap or a period of time before they then go and compete again. Yeah. So that's question one: what to do there. And I think the second question is like, do Nogi and Gi on the same day? Mm -hmm. And then you've got like a big four hour yeah, gap, right? Yeah. So yeah, that's can we answer the first question? Yeah, of course. Yeah, I, I think um, the warm up really. I, I think where I see the biggest mistake in that sort of day is the food because it's hard to eat in that day because you're nervous anyway. So the food's really important on that day. You want stuff that's like easy to digest. So I normally take like overnight oats in my bag, loads of honey in there. I've got electrolytes on me with all water. I've got my Farragon that's on me. So if I'm back in the pen, as you know, from the 
your first comp, did you get forearm burn and stuff in your? No, I wasn't forearm? too bad. To, you be, too to bad. be fair, I'm, to be fair, you say that now, but when you came off the mat, oh, that was the, the first, first thing, you said. yeah, I did actually. Did yeah. I like, on my first one? Yeah. My first yes, one, I went me, my four yeah, 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 yeah. Lock up. That's why I got the Farrow gun on me, so I'm back in the pen and I'm sort of Farrow gun in my arms. I forgot that. Do you know what? Forget most of it though. You do, yeah. I can't even really recollect it really. Most people they don't eat all day, or I see a meeting they'll have like, oh, I've just had one. Was one of the girls from our gym? She was like, ah. I've just weighed in, I've had a sausage roll. And I was like, fuck, <laughs> what is a sausage? She's got protein in it. And I was like, nah, you don't want to be on a sausage roll now. You don't want to get a body lock after that, do you? <laughs> <laughs> so I think like the nutrition on that day is important. It's yeah, just high okay. carb, easy to digest stuff. Yeah. And you can use like honey and stuff like that, overnight mm. like oats. Um, using the fairy gun yeah. during to work out those tight muscles. Mm. And really, after that point, you've got the nervous energy out. So I don't really tend to do another warm up again. I probably should, and I'm not saying it's the right answer. Um, but if I'm if I'm waiting two hours, I'm definitely I'm gonna just do the same same cycle. Yeah, okay. I'm gonna start an hour before, fifteen to twenty minutes warm up, and then I'm gonna try and go in. But yeah. it is difficult to manage that because you're getting called forward, and then you're off the mat, and then you're so it's hard to sort of sometimes yeah. going all day. Yeah. But I think the, where I see the biggest holes is people's nutrition on that day. Cause it's like, okay, you, you're going to compete first at nine and then you, your last one, especially doing the absolute is not till five. So you're going to have a coffee and a sausage roll for lunch and nothing else all day. Like, and because of nerves, you don't really feel hungry. How do you, how do you, how do you manage your nerves? Nerves like, are always there. And I, like, do, you, I, do you get that at local comps still? Yeah. And, you know, it's, no matter sometimes who weirdly more at local comps because people are like, ah, oh, well, there's an expectation of people know yeah, you, I guess. Right. Yeah. Oh, yeah. well, this is easy for you. And it just, you just go and smash this one. We, and I'm like, Pfft. cause sometimes, as I said before, the local comps are used for testing. So say the last army competition I did, I tried some takedowns um, and I don't really do takedowns much. So I always <laughs> forgot and it didn't work out for me and I lost one of the matches, but you know, I think, well, don't get tied to the outcome, Rick, and it's still difficult to, to not get tied to the outcome. Um, so yeah, that, that that that's how I sort of try and manage that. How, how do you manage it though? Like, do you just, just go with the flow? Do like, you do any like visualization or anything like that? Any, uh, any, any methods like I, that at all? I did, I did a white belt and all I'm envisioning at white belt and it sounds insane and it's probably embarrassing saying this, but it's like a black belt gold medal at one of the, one of the big events. And that's all I've had in my focus. All the smaller comps, they don't really matter. I'm just focusing on that black belt sort of medal. Um, and that's what I'm, I'm aiming for. But for the smaller events, I don't, I try and just keep calm. So I stay away from the event for as long as I can. Um, and I try and sleep as much as I can. People hear about me going Vegas and Abu Dhabi and they're like, oh, you must be having an awesome time. I'm like, people don't know. I'm literally in the hotel. I don't even go out. I don't even see anyone. I'm just in the hotel. I'm, if I'm going out, I'm going to go and get some like food, high carbs, back in the hotel room. I'm just going to get my head down and sleep as much as possible. And then when I get to the venue, the, the nerves are there, but you, um, Teddy Atlas, I don't even know who he is. Mm. He's like a, a boxing yeah, trainer. Yeah. yeah. He's got a good thing. He said like, uh, you see it as fire. You see it as the, the fire is always there, but you sort of like, you have to control it. He's, fire is like powerful if you use it to cook or whatever, but also it can burn you as well. So you have to get used to that. It's always there for me. I do think at the higher end of the sport, um, People think like Gordon Rye's arrogant or, and I think you find it at most sportsmen that are at the high, high end and I'm nowhere near there. Um, their confidence is also key for that because they go in without that, that, um, that nerves at all. And I don't know if that's built from just years of competing and just having confidence in their ability or so whether years that's, of winning, I imagine. Yeah, years of winning. That. Self-belief, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, self-belief. I think that pays. Gordon, doesn't he go like ridiculous at like 120? He's still on that run. Yeah, yeah, yeah like, still yeah, unbeaten. Yeah. You know what I mean? That's yeah. fucking nuts. You must feel Crazy. invincible at that point. Yeah. Mm. You know what I mean? And he's not exactly fighting like low-level guys. You no. know what I mean? He's, no. he's running through yeah, he's the, right the best top. in the world. Yeah. By it. So I think, yeah, you've got to use that fear to like just con control it almost and uh, and sort of focus it in to sort of doing damage and, you know, without sounding like... Yeah. Uh, a knob, but like focus it in towards them, yeah, not course, like yeah. in towards yourself. And I think that's what part of this whole game plan and systems that are in place helps you do because you know, okay, I'm in this pressure situation, even if it's your bottom side. Okay, I'm in bottom side. I'm not really tied to the outcome. When this guy moves, I'm going to try and move and get back to a guard or whatever. You feel a bit more confident in that position instead of feeling that like dread and panic, which everyone feels at the start. Um, it's trying to keep that at bay for as long as you can during during the comp and and I think competing a lot does help that. Yeah, good, good advice. Hey, White Belt, any more questions competition-wise? 
no, I'll just shit myself. Covered a lot, <laughs> just, yeah. Yeah. Covered a lot there. Yeah, yeah do you know what I mean? That's pretty much all of it, really, yeah, isn't it? That's cool, man. Thanks, really good advice. So lastly, just injuries. So mm -hmm. I think last year I was watching on Flow Grab and competing in the Masters Worlds. Yes. And uh, maybe offline you might have to talk me through that uh, submission that you did on pretty much everybody, I think. <laughs> but it's funny because you literally did exactly what you've been talking about. You went out, you got a grip, pulled half guys, mm -hmm. and then worked from there. And you were just running through guys. I think you... I think you submitted all of them pretty quickly, put one guy yeah. asleep. Mm -hmm. And then you know, I think the, the final match I saw you in, yeah. was that the semi? Semi, yes, yeah, so a bronze yeah. medal match there. Yeah. yeah. And uh, you had the guys back and you kind of had the hooks in, fell off to the sides mm -hmm. and completely ruptured your ACL. Yes, yeah, so it was PCL ligaments, so the one behind oh, yeah. the guys yeah, at yeah. home. So you got two that cross over in the, in the middle of your knee. The PCL was the one that ruptured and... I think what it was is because I had the guys back and I had the choke locked in. Most of the time when I get injured, it's it's my fault uh, <laughs> because I'm just too I'm too focused in on that that moment trying to win um, and too tense as well. So really, he had his arms down to his side, looking back at what I should have done was slipped off the back and went for the armbar. Um, but at the time, I had the choke locked in. It was like a big comp, and I wanted to win. He was pulling down my head and my hook was inside his thigh. So as he's pulling me forward, my knee's getting twisted and I just felt like a string snap and my knee fell off and I was like, nap, get off me. I'm not having nothing to do with that. I'm not like, you know, for me, it's all about staying on the mats for as long as I can. I'm not bothered. I'd rather, I wouldn't want to like take a gold medal and have a broken foot. I'd rather just not win anything and still train the next day yeah, okay. or whenever I can. Um, so yeah, I ruptured my PCL. Um, went into panic mode after that because obviously the, the team I went out there the army team were mm. awesome and um, obviously kept supporting them throughout and didn't really do any research until I got home mm. when I got home they weren't too sure because I think a lot of the you know when we went for the training schedule um, earlier on I do a lot of prehab stuff every day so even though my two lifting days are on Monday and Thursday in between those days I'm doing hamstring uh, work quad work I'm doing all sort of knee stuff backward sled pulls and all neck stuff so anytime I do get injured it's like it's never like seems touch wood to last yeah. for a long time um, and then when I looked into it, actually PCO injuries I think um, a lot of people have just carried on with their sport um, I think you lads probably know about this like rubber players they don't really have ACLs and stuff mm -hmm. and and even um, and wrestlers, I looked at the wrestlers and stats, and they're like, even at the national level, I think like eighty percent of them have got no ACLs. And I was like, what? <laughs> what is going on with that? Um, so I looked at it, and I thought, like you know, realistically, doing this training program, competing like this, I probably got two or three years. Mm. Um, so. I strengthen my quad up anyway, strengthen the hamstring up. And there's, there's a test you can do where you start to move the, mm -hmm. the yeah, bottom of the, forward, yeah, yeah, back up. And it doesn't move at all. It's solid. And I can get a full range of squats now and that it's, it's back in. I haven't had no operation on it and touch wood. I won't need to. Um, and I think it probably will come a time when I really need that up, maybe after this competition season or whatever's over in a few years. And um, that's when I probably will go back for the operation. Yeah. Okay. I, yeah. I didn't know the full extent of like the, yeah, I guess the injury and the recovery. How did that affect you mentally? Because I, I, I think I remember you, you were obviously fairly active on social media. Yeah. But just thinking back, and I might be wrong, so do correct me, but it feels like there was a period where you just kind of, just, you know, weren't, weren't really posting. Yes. And yeah, I wonder, because I've had injuries mm -hmm. and I found myself in a pretty dark place on a couple of occasions. Yeah. Did you go there at all? or I how did, did you yeah, it? I did go there. But it's, it's funny enough that... Um, like as soon as I get injuries, because it it comes up quite a lot with the sport, and now which I'm training, it comes up quite a lot. I've, my one job at that moment is to get back on the mats. I'm not like social media. I love it. I love to sort of be around the community, but that's sort of like sometimes it can be up to an hour a day. And also, yeah, I'm not. I don't really want to talk to that many people when I'm injured. <laughs> I just want to get back on the mats. So my sole focus, my sole focus is sort of uh, you know rehab work and sort of getting back to that position where I can get back on the mats. Um, I've been through those dark times quite a few times in my, in my sort of life and and what I've always found is um, there's a positive that comes out of it. So let's go back to the knee injury for an example. Um, you know, I'm always trying to adapt my game and change my game um, and trying to learn new stuff. But, uh, you know, after you've done the same thing for quite a while, you always revert back to that same thing, that same game. Even though you're trying to learn new skills, it's quite difficult to actually implement those new skills and it's quite difficult to do them in sparring. 
Um, but when I had the knee injury, I couldn't play bottom guard for a long time. I could play, say, a half guard and do a quick sweep, but I couldn't take it. Um, I couldn't risk the person on top sort of having me in the open guard sort of position because the knee wasn't safe. Mm. Um, so when I went back training, I had to um, I had to just sweep quick and then I had to start from side control and sort of pin the person down in side control and work on pressure top from top. And now I've developed this whole new sort of system from top side. I'm a top side control. I tapped someone out you know, a few weeks ago from just top side pressure and it's a brown belt sort of four stripe mm. adult. Like I think he was 94 kilos. So no like chump at all. And that was only because of my knee injury. And I think looking back at any of the stuff that I've been through, those sort of dark periods, um, you always come out there sort of with a different sort of look on stuff and you can sort of, you know, I can see it being um, positive in, in, in the long run. But even when you are going through that injury, it sucks and you're in a bad place. It's a bit like I was saying before, you're on that sort of downhill and uphill spiral, just knowing that, okay, it's sucked now, but you'll be fixed in in the future yeah i think yeah. you lads have found that with your injuries and stuff or? yeah it's a funny one because i've i've lived through injuries but mm -hmm. also when i was doing my degree it was around exercise rehabilitation and yeah. we did a whole module on injury psychology mm -hmm. and they looked we looked at some different models and one of the models is the grief response model yeah and it's literally the same cycle of emotions that you go through when someone dies yeah to when you get injured if That's certainly crazy. if you're like an elite athlete and, and you get injured, it's all the same stuff. It's like denial, mm -hmm. um, reasoning, anger, like feeling bad for yourself. There's yeah. a whole cycle and it's the exact same one that happens when you grieve as well. So it's a fascinating thing. But yeah, as you say, I think it's just sometimes working your way through and trying to take the positives from it. Yeah, because they, they are there. They're definitely, I think you said you had a rib injury was last time. Yeah, mate, I've yeah. Got, yeah. Yeah, yeah, but, is, uh, yeah, intercostal muscle, yeah, I think it was. Yeah, which is, like, it's probably mo the most common one I see, at, like, the white belt level, I think, because yeah. that I've, thoracic... I, I know a few people that have had those little injuries, and I, I yeah. think it's just, you're not used to those movements. No, you're not. Do you know what I mean? Like, you know, shrimping, bridging, you know, all those types of things, you know, day to day, you don't ever do that yeah. shit, yeah, yeah, you know what I mean? You, don't, you never do it. And then when you start jiu-jitsu, most people become obsessed with it. Yeah. And like you said earlier, like you do it five days a week. I remember I was fucking every class I could get to. Mm -hmm. And then you end up just getting that injury. And I'll tell you what, it fucking hurts. Oh, it does, yeah. It really it fucking affects, hurts. It affects everything, it, that's why. It fucking hurts, you yeah. know what I mean? I've had some real shit injuries over the years. But that there, fucking really fucking mm -hmm. hurt. Like, but what you'll find now is your frames will be better when you go back to the... They fucking had to be, mate, yeah, when I went back. Be, yeah, you could, as, as soon as anyone was like big, I was like, oh, fucking hell, here we go. That's yeah, you have to keep those frames in there. And I think that's how you get, that's how you get to sort of, I think, you know, my theory is like a black belt, you've injured each limb so many times that you've been used to not using it. And then when it comes back, you sort of, you have to adapt your game so much throughout that period. So like the, the ribs would be, frames you have to keep in at the minute i've got a neck injury which means i can't tuck my chin as much so i leave a gap here so people are guillotining me really easy but it's before in the past i've probably been guilty of leaving my neck out and sort of like because it's quite robust um escaping once i'm in that bad position but now i can't even risk people getting to the front headlock position so i've got to develop something beyond that now to sort mm. of to so stop to stop them doing to stop them doing yeah. it yeah so you're like another sort of i think that's what i like about jiu-jitsu though is like you can you can do it for you know effectively the rest of your life on and off with you know, mm. injuries and stuff like that managing that sort of stuff but mm. because you can compete at all ages you know when I was playing football you see, you're done by 32 33 you know what I mean <laughs> yeah. I ended up you know retiring just through injuries you know I was like fucking Mr Glass mate towards the end never <laughs> used to take a piss I broke my arm this came my shoulders broke my wrist you know all sorts of shit you know in a quite a small period but once that starts happening in football and you lose that mm. like a bit of momentum you have to retire where yeah. quite like jiu-jitsu where I, in my head it's it's not something that I'm going to do yeah. for five years it's something that I, I hope I do for the rest of my life yeah you yeah. know what I mean and I, I quite like that yeah no it's good for that and to be fair I, I did some research again on my degree around it was female jiu-jitsu mm -hmm. but did like an epidemiology study um where i just looked at all the different injuries and compared them to other sports and actually it's 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 not as bad as it seems yeah i think if you look at it, it because we do it so much as you say you it feels you get injured a lot but actually if you look at it like per hours spent on that yeah it, it's I've been fine. Aren't, other, aren't other, that other than my ribs yeah. which i think was just like a like i said like an yeah. muscle. like i haven't 
touch wood. Today, it's, <laughs> it's, coming, yeah. it's coming, it's yeah. coming. Yeah. Yeah. Well, 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 Especially as you get yeah. older, mate. <laughs> <laughs> In a month, I'll be like, yes, like, yeah. fucking rip my shoulder off. Yeah. Like, <laughs> fuck. Yeah. I think the other thing with injury as well, which is really important, is like one of the. I can remember I looked at some research a while back in regard to the reasons why people stop training. And I think the, I think the first one was feeling incompetent. Mm-hmm. The second one was like a break in routine. Um, and with injuries as well, it can be really isolating. So yeah. I think my advice to people who are doing jujitsu, which is quite, although it's like a, a competition wise, a singular sport, it's obviously a team based sport in regards to the training Definitely. and it's still good to be around that. So I think if people are injured yeah. um, and again, I'm, I'm not, I haven't practiced what I've preached when I say this, but <laughs> I think still getting on, getting down to the club, seeing people, staying in the community and, and watching, I think is really good as well. I yeah, think really I think we noticed that on um, pre-COVID because of the evening sessions, believe it or not, a lot of people didn't like to give away their evening time now because they used to spend that time with their family and stuff so that the actual daytime and the morning classes got a lot more busier. The evening classes now are back up, but it was just that like period of like, not being used to sacrificing that time. So if you're injured for like two or three months and you've got a time with family and you're used to doing whatever in that extra time, and then you're asked to go back and I'm exactly like you, I don't really practice what I preach with that as well. But it's, you know, you could you could use that error of that class where you're sitting and watching to do your prehab work or your rehab work. And I have done that before where I'd be just in the side and just do my exercises if I need to. Um, but it's a difficult one to sort of get yourself motivated to drive down to class mm. and just sit there and watch. It's almost yeah. like... You learn a lot, though, doing that. Yeah. Yeah. I've, I watched, think I've you watched do, a few and then I've like, watched I'm them just and I've like, oh, come on. Oh, you want to train, don't you? Yeah, you, you want to train. train. You yeah, just hate you, you less. Like, you feel jealous. You're like, yeah. bastards. And there is always the risk that you then do train and you just prolong your, your recovery. Yeah. So it's it's a it's a fine line. Yeah. All right, mate. Perfect. Um, just to wrap up, mate, is there a, sort of like, you know, what's the end goal with it and or, or anything coming up that you want to chat about real quick, finish? Um, so I think end goal is like always to try and be a good black belt. Um, I think what I've noticed over the, I've, you know, I feel like I've been in the sport a little bit of time now. And, and what I've found that um, I really like at the minute is the change that it makes. And I think you, you boys will know this as well, that, you know, we've had guys that walked in at white belt, young lads, and now they're sort of like purple belt teachers and they're confident and they're just changed individuals for what the sports offer to them. So I think helping charities like Reorg and the and the Army sort of sports to push more BJJ and getting more of it out there, that'll probably be my focus in the future more. Obviously got the World Masters coming up where I'll be competing at that in Vegas. Um and I've got some other competitions, but I do know this pacing gonna last forever. And also so I I do feel like I've had certain addictions in my life, should we say, and that was competition and I do feel like Moving on, it'll be sort of more coaching role and helping like more people get involved in it because it's such a good sport. Mm, yeah, um, it is. And it makes a big difference. And as I was saying before, it's not just the, in- the difference that individual, it's that ripple effect that it has on those individuals to like everyone that, they, that they're in contact with, um, which is massive. Yeah, I think if, uh, if not just guys, but everybody on the planet did you just, it'd be a better place Yeah, right? yeah, definitely guys and girls, yeah. Yeah, awesome. Perfect, I think we're done, mate. Boom, Thanks, awesome. Amazing, mate.